Hannah Martin. I'm the executive director at Hourglass, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our community forum, Food for Thought. I heard we put a dent in the wine, so everyone's probably feeling great coming into the event. We're expecting a good evening. <laughs> Food provides some of our deepest connections to place and to each other. While Lancaster County has long been known for farming and as a destination for foodies, our goal for you today is to think about these deep connections every time you pick up your fork. What we eat connects us to our culture, our shared resources, our health, and our community. Tonight you will hear several short talks and videos on topics ranging from local food to the comeback of oysters in the Chesapeake Bay. We're also honored to be joined by our keynote speaker, National Geographic explorer and photographer, George Steinmetz, who will be the final presenter this evening. This forum was made possible thanks to the generosity of our sponsors, including The Giant Company, Clark Associates, Lancaster Local Provisions, The Sela V, Josephine's, and Belvedere Restaurant Group, Connective, Monty and Molly Milner, and Paul Mueller. Thank you all so much for your support. <laughs> telling you, it's the wine. We're already getting applauses. Um, well, thank you all so much for being here. I hope you find the evening very informative and inspiring. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Joe Arthur, the executive director of the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank, who is going to speak about hunger in our community. Do I really look that big? Man, I gotta get, <laughs> wow. So uh, for all the people that did have an alcoholic beverage, so you're my people, so uh, I'll catch up with you later. Thank you very much, thank you Hourglass, thank you for everybody that's uh, attending today and thank you to the sponsors. Uh, really appreciate being an, uh, an opportunity to uh, really talk about our story, our mission in the context of food and agriculture, the future of food and agriculture. So I'm the executive director at Central Pennsylvania Food Bank. Um, we work uh, throughout the whole Susquehanna Valley. Um, in Lancaster County, which is our largest county of population, uh, we work with about 100 organizations to feed people in need. Uh, and I've met some of, uh, some of our friends and partners in the work here today, so good to see you. Uh, and uh, if I do say something that doesn't sound true, you just keep quiet. That's me, um, that's what I do at the food bank, and um, I'm just very honored and blessed to have uh, a second career. My previous career was in uh, finance and accounting and banking, and that was all great, uh, but this is what I really love. This is what I've been wired for, so um, I know you can read, and uh, yeah, that's enough about me. This is our service territory, and we're in Pennsylvania, so I can get away with this next comment. Um, that's about twice the size, geographically, of the state of New Jersey. So if you're from New Jersey, <laughs> tough, right? Um, and how do we serve over 27 counties, 18,000 uh, plus square miles, partnerships. We work with organizations that feed people right in the neighborhood, whether that's urban, suburban, uh, rural. We have hunger uh, everywhere throughout the United States, the world, uh, and here in central Pennsylvania. Uh, but we have about 1,200 partners uh, doing this work. So this is a little bit of an infomercial, but we're going to get to something that really ties into the topic, so just, so just bear with me. One thing to remember, uh, food insecurity. So we used to say hunger a lot, but that gets a little confusing. That's used too generically uh, in our culture. I'm hungry. I'm hungry at lunch. Joe is hungry all the time. Um, but I have, I have food security, uh, and I'm blessed. But food insecurity is a lack of consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy life. Focus on, on healthy. So just to let you know uh, a little bit about what happened in the pandemic, uh, graphically on a map, the darker the colors, the higher food insecurity. 
Uh, so in those 27 counties in 2019, we looked like that. Any food insecurity is not good, but 2019 was a heck of a lot more manageable um, than once the pandemic hit. So in 2020, you see those colors get dark. So they get up in the range of 13, 14, 15, 16% of the county population being food insecure. Now, if you think about that, that's like one in seven people, one in seven. Children, it's not on the map, about one in five during that time. Every fifth child in school. Food insecure, not sure where that next healthy meal is coming from. So in 2020, things, as you, as you saw in the media, really got um, just off the charts. Uh, need grew, and it grew here in central Pennsylvania by about 40%. Uh, fortunately, with the help that went out from the, uh, from the federal government, the state government, helped really uh, help people recover to a large degree, but not everybody. So in 2021, we see improvement, but if you compare 21 to 2019, we still landed with higher food insecurity. And where we are now is facing uh, the secondary crisis. So the health crisis seems to be getting under control reasonably well. And if you lost somebody during uh, the pandemic, which I did, um, you know, my heart goes out to you. Um, we can never get that back, but we, we do seem to be managing it down. But we have this inflation that's facing us, right? So it's facing everybody. It's facing all companies, all organizations, facing the food bank. But the real issue is our neighbors. And some of those neighbors are now becoming neighbors in need, either again or for the first time, because this is happening so quickly, it's outpacing wages uh, for a lot, of our, a lot of our neighbors. So back to food and agriculture. So um, how about those carrots? I, I think of them as carrot people. <laughs> so uh, any Harry Potter fans? So you would expect maybe little eyes to pop out and they start talking, right? Um, but those carrot people are, are very nutritious, right? So just uh, um, some of you that are in the food businesses, like some of our speakers. Um, so that doesn't sell in the grocery store. It doesn't sell um, in the farmer's markets too well, maybe end of day. So our preferences as consumers cause a lot of waste, right? So we're part of the solution to get the carrot people to the kitchen table. Right? So that's true, like really uh, the produce aisle has become kind of a beauty contest. And we as Americans are probably worse in, the worst in the world. Is that, George, would you say, as far as consumer preferences? Yeah, Europe, right? Um, but we, with our preferences and willingness to pay really high prices for the really beautiful produce, actually trigger a lot of waste, a lot of cull. So uh, food banks, ours in particular, are doing a darn good job of, of trying to get and divert that produce to kitchen tables, right? So about 15 million pounds last year of that type of produce. And actually, most of it looked pretty good. It's not all, you know, carrot people. Um, and also, a lot of fresh milk. We have a huge uh, fresh milk program, or program that's not uh, terribly common around the country, but we've had a dairy crisis for years. And so we've scaled up a program to make sure um, that wonderful milk, six million servings of it last year, gets to kitchen tables, to people in need. So uh, this is where we tie into the subject of the day. So uh, this is a three plus minute video. Um, and what this video is about, just to preface it, is our innovation uh, that we started last year to start connecting our partners with local farms. We already do that on a large scale as the food bank, but the food bank deals in truckloads. Our, our small local for, farms, uh, our scales don't match well, but they do match with our, our local pantries. So our endeavor is helping to get funding to our partners to help local farmers get that surplus, the smaller quantities, um, to help people in need right in their neighborhood. So uh, without further ado. Delicious fruits and vegetables in every shape and size. Protein-packed eggs, beef, pork, poultry, 
fresh milk and cheese. Pennsylvania's farming community grows all of it in our own backyard. Everyone deserves to have good, nutritious food and enough of it to live healthy, successful lives. Our powerful partnership with area farmers makes the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank's mission of fighting hunger, improving lives, and strengthening communities a reality. Produce is amazing. I mean, oranges, apples, lettuce, tomatoes, peppers. I mean, oh, it's just great. Each year we source truckloads of fresh, healthy food from local farms when normal retail channels aren't available. Instead of plowing it under or letting it go to waste, we give it to those who need a helping hand. A true win-win. The food bank is like a secondary outlet for farmers with a surplus. And we welcome seconds and ugly produce that is still nutritious but doesn't sell. Programs like the Pennsylvania Agriculture Surplus System or PASS, the Bid by Donate program, for livestock and our own farmer to agency resource market or farm grant program. Get fresh from the farm commodities to our neighbors in need, right near the farm through local pantries, soup kitchens, and shelters just a few miles away. This is especially helpful to smaller growers and farmers markets. So being farmers, we, we really cringe at food waste. And so working with our food bank partner has just been a really great way to get all this great food that we have to people who can use it. Um, and they've been really great about being able to come pick up from us. And that's been key to, to our relationship. The partnership with the Fulton County Food Basket and the New Morning Farm, it's just such a great program to be able to partnership with somebody that's able to give us the fresh fruit and vegetables that we need. We get all kinds of produce, fruits and vegetables all year, all season long. The Central Pennsylvania Food Bank is committed to sharing the freshest, most nutritious, and culturally diverse food to people facing hunger. Our territory is wide, but our impact is local. Cultivating these local relationships, as well as purchasing nutritious products, are key to helping us meet the growing demand for charitable food assistance. There is dignity in having access to food that tastes good, respects, culture, and is good for you. Together, we give hope through the healing power of healthy, local farm fresh food. Yeah, so what do you think of that? Okay. So uh, that last slide about partnering, we mean that. So uh, at the end of these slides, um, my contact information, and I'll be hanging around here. Uh, we'd love to hear from you if you'd like to partner. So just very quickly, uh, just a little sketch of our programs. Um, we have many, many youth programs serving almost 200,000 kids and teens um, throughout the surface territory, which is just mind boggling. Um, senior programs, um, we have special uh, programs that uh, bring boxes to seniors. And one of our partners, Meals on Wheels, here in Lancaster, is a great partner in that work. Uh, military Share, we have the, um, the only, um, in the food bank world, the only privately funded uh, program that focuses on veterans uh, and active duty military and their families that are struggling with hunger. It's one of the gaps um, for uh, military service. So we have over 38 sites that we, uh, we work with military service organizations to help um, uh, folks that are either in the military or um, have served and are struggling. We work with healthcare uh, locally here with uh, Lancaster General Hospital uh, or health system, as well as uh, Penn State Health locally and a number of others uh, on programs that directly help uh, people that are food insecure um, to follow their clinical guidance from their doctors and nurses. And um, we do direct referrals with them and also interventions to make sure they have healthy food. Uh, and we're doing that on a fairly large scale, which makes us kind of unusual around the country. Uh, we also do outreach for benefit programs that help people um, have enough food and get that food right in the grocery store with our partners like Giant Foods, one of our wonderful uh, sponsors today. Just very quickly, uh, a little bit more infomercial and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, we're volunteer driven. So 10,000 volunteers last year, 84,000 hours just at our food bank. Multiples of that with our partners who are primarily volunteer driven. 
And um, for every dollar that's donated, this is the pitch, uh, we can produce uh, or we can share about six meals worth of nutritious food. Uh, so proud of that, and we're still managing to do that even with inflation. We'll see next year. Um, and, and advocate. We could usually help advocating with legislators to keep this work going. And that's how you can help us uh, fight hunger. Proud of all these volunteers. Um, special note, Harrisburg Police Department at the bottom left, um, who helped us feed children throughout the pandemic. They volunteered as a, as a force. How about that? And that's how to find me. And that's how to find us on social media. So uh, we have a minute or two for Q&A. All right, we apparently have a minute or two left. You won't find me on social media, by the way. This is our food bank. That's not my thing. Can't see it too well. If anybody's raising their hand. Yes? So that we can contact you, would you mind going back on slide, please? Thank you. You got that memorized? Good. There you go. Let's <laughs> <laughs> <Just> play. <laughs> I'm a little, a little hard to see, so if you're raising your hand, yell. Up, up in the corner. I'll get to a serious answer, but I'm not sure I can go through another one without retiring, right? So, so, so I'm, I'm still here and I'm not retiring. But, but if that happens, you know, that may move me. Um, but serious note, um, part of the reason for that um, endeavor that uh, we showed in the video is uh, one of the pandemic learnings, our food systems are consolidated in the US, extremely consolidated, and we saw what happened. We saw what happened with uh, meat production. Uh, we saw what happened with food service. Um, so that consolidation worked against us, and, and we saw it's not as reliable as we thought. Um, so local sourcing needs to be a much bigger part of our work, and I think that's a food industry at large uh, concept that's, um, that's growing. So we need to build that resilience in order to prepare for whatever comes next. Um, and it's also efficient, healthy food, it kind of all aligns with, with our other goals. Uh, but we do need to build in resilience because there probably will be a next time. Hopefully, you know, we don't shut down our economy and, and all of that. We've learned a lot of things. Um, but, you know, we learned pandemics happen. Other things happen too. I had one over here. Sir. Yes. What, what's the nature of your relationship and you know, what do you, for lack of a better way to say, what do you do for those local food banks, food banks that they might have health problems? We do a lot for them, but the, our primary job is to help them raise uh, enough healthy food for people in need. So we're, we're a key supplier. On average, about three quarters of our partner's food comes from us. So we do that on a large scale, but we also raise a lot of funding to provide grants for them to help them in their mission. We do a lot of training, everything from healthy eating, cooking on a, a lower budget, food safety, you name it. We do serve safe training for those of you that are in the restaurant world. So we do a lot of wraparound services, um, but our primary role is to get healthy food for our partners um, and, and actually help them to, uh, to raise funding for the tougher to fund programs. So. Am I am I getting the hook? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Set this down. There's a little refrigerator here. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Joe. Uh, while the challenge of food insecurity is certainly great, we're lucky to have hardworking folks in our community working to address the issue. In addition to Central PA Food Bank, I know we have representatives in the audience from organizations like Meals on Wheels and Power Packs Projects. So thank you all for being here and the work that you do.
Okay, great. Well, our next speakers this evening are Chris Ballantyne and Jesse Tuno from Southern Market Center. Chris is the community relations manager for Willow Valley, and Jesse is the owner of Butter and Bean, the coffee and pastry shop in Southern Market Center. They're going to speak about Southern Market's new food lab incubator and how Lancaster is supporting budding food entrepreneurs. Thanks. It's the tie. Um, thank you, Diana, and thank you, Hourglass, for having this forum. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you, and I'm excited to tell you the story in part about Southern Market before Jesse comes and tells you her journey as a culinary entrepreneur. So with that, Southern Market is the city's grandest building, both because of its architecture and in its size. That's how the local Lancaster paper described it when Southern Market opened its doors in 1888. Designed by C. Emblin Urban, it was built for use as a farmer's market and nearly operated that way for about 100 years. By the mid-80s, operations had dwindled um, and the city decided to transition it into office space when the, the Chamber of Commerce came in, assets came in, and it also hosted city council. By the 2010s, both Southern Market as a building and the intersection between South Queen and South Vine Street were identified as underutilized by the Lancaster City Alliance. So looking to sell the building, the city decided to put out a series of RFPs, requests for proposals, to see what somebody would do with the building. And at that time, Lancaster Equity had presented an idea that included a food hall incubation model um, that is in operation today. And that's what had them actually win the bid um, from the city of Lancaster. Meanwhile, Willow Valley Communities was looking to expand its operations for a 55 plus active adult uh, apartment building. And it settled uh, its sites on the LMP building, which it acquired, which is right across the street from Southern Market. So upon hearing about the revitalization project happening in Southern Market, Willow Valley Communities felt that it was a great opportunity to join as a collaborative partner and to invest further in the city beyond its own um, project. So 134 years after Southern Market opened its doors, it comes full circle. It's been revitalized where food is once again the driving force and the community connector. So with that, Southern, Southern Market's legacy comes full circle, returning to its original purpose, although its what and its how looks different. So in 1888, the result was the community came together, it sold and it bought fresh fruits, produce, and other goods. Today, it's a first-class food hall with flavors from around the world. So food combined with an entrepreneurial platform that is Southern Market allows our ambitious neighbors and friends to pour their passions into developing their own small businesses. Also, this transformed landmark offers a new and wonderful gathering place for the community to come together. Earlier, I mentioned the collaborative partnership between Willow Valley Communities and Lancaster Equity. Assets is the third partner. So given their service to small business startups, it was important that they return to Southern Market to have a relationship with the vendors, especially since a significant number of assets clients actually have food-related businesses. So assets expertise will help to give guidance to the food hall vendors as they're growing their businesses within Southern Market, implementing business strategies, training, and um, helping them to develop their specific plans. So with the modern modernization of Southern Market completed, this is what it looks like today. And if you haven't been inside, shame on you, because you should be. <laughs> so the second floor is private office spaces, and the first floor is home to the 10 vendor stands, uh, which surround Bar 1888, which is named for the, the, the year that the building was constructed. So comfortably seating 250 people, the food hall houses 10 vendor stands, as I mentioned, Bar 1880, but also inside what you'll find is Butter and Bean Coffee Shop, located right inside the, the Queen Street 
entrance and a pizzeria that's currently under development and should be open, I think, mid-May. And that's one of the front retail spaces. So the resources provided to these vendors present a feasible pathway to re achieving their dreams. From the location proximity that's close to Penn Square, which is one block down, to outfitting each stand, also the commissary kitchen, which has commercial appliances where they all do a shared space. Uh, each one has their own space to prepare, present, and then offer their cuisines, all the way down to the glasses, the silverware, the plates, and even the support staff. All of that is a significant amount of overhead costs and um, concerns, overwhelming minutia of daily operations um, that have been removed from their purview so that they can just focus on perfecting their craft and then growing their businesses. So it's important that Southern Market Food Hall is representative of the, the rich and diverse culture of the city of Lancaster, and it does. As these culinary entrepreneurs build their businesses with the incubation and support mechanisms in place, we anticipate that they will outgrow the resources at Southern Market. Individually, when the timing is best, they'll transition their operations to their own brick and mortar locations or whatever their ultimate vision of their business is. This successful progression will further diversify Lancaster's restaurant scene and contribute to the creation of more jobs and opportunities within the city. Then the Southern Market team will go to the, the, the wait list and embrace and welcome the next potential vendors uh, ready to incubate their businesses. So if you've not yet been to Southern Market and you're wondering what you're missing, let me whet your appetite. <laughs> These are just some of the meals that you can get at Southern Market. Um, everything from the chicken tangine to uh, maple brisket ribs that Lat uh, Four E's Latin Cuisine does, um, all the way to cupcakes in a jar, gluten-free cakes, wonderful pastries, scones, and breakfast items from butter and bean. So if you haven't been there, it's literally 100 South Queen Street, a block and so over. And let me assure you, it's all delicious. So with that, today Southern Market offers a pathway for culinary entrepreneurs to realize their dreams. This revitalized landmark is a draw to locals and visitors alike in a grand attempt to truly support these budding businesses and culinary entrepreneurs. So to tell her story as a culinary entrepreneur in the city and as a Southern Market operator, please welcome Jesse Tuno. Thank you. Thank you. A little bit about me. My name is Jessie Tuno. Um, we've lived here in Lancaster County uh, about uh, 24 years. Um, I started in the restaurant industry about 20 years ago. Um, started out more of convenience than anything else, not really a desire to work in the restaurant industry. Uh, we had two small kids at the time, and um, daycare is extremely expensive for two babies. So um, I took a job working at a local pastry shop, um, just opening up the bakery in the morning. Uh, I met a retired chef there who just spoke so eloquently about food, and it really just opened up my eyes to the entire industry of, uh, of the culinary industry. Um, several years later, I decided that I was really enjoying this, and I needed more education, so I went to culinary school. I ended up being the, uh, one of the oldest students in my class. Um, <clears throat> which it was good, but of course you're always the one that everyone comes to then when, uh, when their grades are not so good. So um, after graduating, I actually graduated at the top of my class, held a 4.0. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Worked around in several uh, fine dining restaurants here in Lancaster County um, and really just developed my own passion for this industry. Um, I've really had a great experience uh, in all the different restaurants, but it's always been 
being the female and being a minority in the kitchen. Um, I remember specifically when I was finishing up with my uh, internship, or I was finishing up with my schooling and I was getting ready to go out on my internship, the gentleman that I worked for uh, at the restaurant, I wanted to work in the kitchen and he looked straight in my eye and said, I don't believe in having women in the kitchen. And besides, you're too pretty. I want to have you out front. So I said, well, okay, then I'm going to have to find somewhere that will allow me to be in the kitchen. So <laughs> it's always challenging uh, being in a role um, that's non-traditional in a, a female role. Um, it is becoming more and more um, a tradition that you do see more females in a leadership position in the restaurants. Um, <clears throat> but I still, even to this day at Southern Market, will have someone who comes up to my husband and say, oh, is this your stand? And my husband is always so gracious and says, nope, this is actually my wife's business. So <clears throat> it's always um, challenging to face this. Um, as an entrepreneur, your mind goes to all of these really cool things that you can do. I can do whatever I want. I can work the hours that I want. I can set my own rules. I can cook whatever I want. But when the reality comes in and you're there from 3 a.m. till 10 p.m., that reality sets in really quickly. And then you get to tax time. And tax time, you decide, you know what, I don't know if this is for me. <laughs> I just want to go back to being an employee. <laughs> <clears throat> but especially as an entrepreneur and a chef in this industry, you have such a unique experience, a passion in the final product when you go to a fine dining restaurant and you see that beautiful symphony <clears throat> of an exquisitely, <clears throat> excuse me, an exquisitely pla plated dish, perfectly seared scallops, a beautiful mid-rare filet, beautifully cooked vegetables that still have that beautiful color to them and just the right amount of softness. But as a chef, we also see that passion from a raw product. You see that beautiful produce as it comes from the ground, the animal that's given its life for you to be able to consume, and we want to respect that product. One of the other jobs that I've had previous to owning my business, I was a culinary instructor. We teach our culinary students from day one to respect the product, respect every aspect of that product. Tip to tail, we want to make sure that every product, everything that we can get out of that item is used and utilized and that nothing goes to waste. Especially when you're a business owner and now we're looking at it from that food cost point of view, now we see it in a different light. Now we think and we teach this to our students how much is that half an onion costing you every time we throw that away? Not just in the waste, but also in that waste of the product itself. So you see, culinary industry is full of creative ADHD brains. We are the types that we just need to go, we need to touch, we need to feel, we need to be doing and moving. And so all of this, uh, it's, it's so overwhelming when you become that entrepreneur. Uh, it's one of those that we really have to rein things in and settle our brains a little bit to really focus in on what it is that we want to present, how we present it, and teach others that, uh, that presentation. <clears throat> As an entrepreneur, we can't sit still. We have to sit down and to do the numbers and the paperwork and all the mundane day-to-day -day stuff is very challenging. We'd rather work a 16-hour shift, sleep four hours, and then go back in and do it again than to sit down and do the paperwork. <clears throat> but here I am, <clears throat> and yes, I do coffee. Not necessarily the food side of things as what I had been once, but coffee is my life, and I'm still a chef at heart. This is my starting point. This is my toe in the water of entrepreneurship. I've taught other people <clears throat> and my students over the last four years about running businesses, running food costs, people management, but it's so different when you're in it. It's so different when it's yours. <clears throat> the numbers are important when it's yours. <clears throat> Those numbers are even more real when you have product and you're working so hard for such little margins. 
So the next time when you go into an independently owned restaurant and you see $50 for a steak and potatoes and a vegetable, think about how that product has come to you. <clears throat> think about the work from the farmers to the chefs that have put that together, who have taken that time to <clears throat> put the care and their passions into that for you. We put our plates, we put our passion on our plate for the world to judge day after day, and we come back to it day after day. We do it because we love it. So butter and bean uh, is my passion, and I want to thank Chris and thank Hourglass for having us here today. Um, we are, as Chris said, we're down on 100 South Queen Street, uh, just a couple blocks from here. Uh, we'd love to have you in, and we'll see you then. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Chris and Jesse. Southern Market has become one of my quick favorites, and if you haven't been, you have to go. And Jesse, I had this amazing Pop-Tart last week that just like blew my mind. <laughs> As a maker myself and a business owner, I applaud all of Lancaster's food entrepreneurs, and I wish the producers showcase at the Southern Market the best of luck. I'm Diana Smedley, co-founder of Lancaster Local Provisions, one of tonight's sponsors, and I'm just thrilled to be here. I've already had such inspiring words come at me from you wonderful people. My husband Gabriel and I founded Lancaster Local Provisions to create awareness around how our food is produced and to support farmers and food producers that make Lancaster County so unique. We curate signature gift boxes that highlight locally handcrafted goods, and we specialize in business gifting. Our mission is to help organizations deliver joy to their clients, employees, and donors, while making it easy for them to support local farmers and makers. We also value our area's precious landscape, and we pledge 1% of our sales to Lancaster Farmland Trust and its efforts to preserve Lancaster's farmland. Through our partnership with the Trust, I've met and become good friends with Alex Wagner from the Fields Edge Research Farm. I admire his tenacity to question the status quo of food production. And he grows some really good sweet potatoes. So it's my pleasure to welcome Alex to the stage, who's gonna speak about putting the culture back in agriculture. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the farming that we do at the Fields Edge, which is located near Lidditz in northern Lancaster County. Um, throughout the history of agriculture, there have been hundreds of different crop varieties that farmers have grown for subsistence that are on the verge of extinction today. And my mission became to explore those and ask which ones are relevant for our food system, which are economic opportunities for farmers to grow food more sustainably, or for us as consumers to have more nutritionally complete diets. And the tomatoes you see behind me are not just beautiful, but these were the varieties that survived a late blight outbreak a couple years back when we had almost 200 varieties of tomatoes in production. So there are very real reasons to think about crop diversity in our food system. And, um, we have projects that range from exploring alternative foods like sesame uh, because it's a drought resistant oil seed that has a lot of potential as a value added um, crop. And we have mizunas and sorrels and kales that can be used in baby salad mix that are several times more nutritious than lettuce. And if you think about the landscape if you think about our modern diet, which pretty much we all in this room share one that revolves around 10 or 20 different species of foods, and you think about our farming landscape, the land is a reflection of how we eat. When I think of home, being born and raised in Lancaster County, a cornfield is often what comes to mind. And it's, this is just um, a thin slice of what farming has looked like here and in other parts of the world. And so we're interested in crops like low heat tropical chilies that have all the nutritional value of hot peppers but without the heat. And so we often bring chefs into our work so that we can learn to take something that is unique and find out how do we make it palatable for all of us 
So the milkweed capers that you see at the lower left-hand corner of the screen, they are from the common eastern milkweed, Asclepius syriaca, which is native to the eastern United States. And in farms of the past, wild plants used to coexist along with cultivated crops in fence lines and hedgerows. And this, these are some of the features you don't see in oceans of corn. But milkweed flower buds are perfectly edible. And when they're lacto-fermented, they work just like Mediterranean capers, which gave chefs an opportunity to put local capers on the menus at area restaurants when they're in season. So these are the kinds of uh, solutions or crop choices that we're interested in. And I'm a first generation vegetable farmer. My grandparents were commercial flower farmers, but sold their farm in the 70s, long before I was born. And one of the things that struck me, first I should say I had the privilege of growing up with them, learning some of my Pennsylvania Dutch foods from my grandma and gardening with them both. And one of the things that struck me about their lives is how hard they worked. Farming for them was physically, emotionally, and economically difficult. And that still hasn't changed. The majority of medium and small size farms in Pennsylvania, the last time there was a major survey done, are not making a living wage. And why is that? We have all these possibilities to create niches in our food system that can be um, an antidote to commodity crops for farmers. So sometimes this looks like a neon colored salad mix that I grow over the winter to talk to restaurants and consumers about why these greens are healthier. And as a farm, I can command a higher price off season and uh, we can skirt some of the pest and disease issues that we normally have during the summer. So we have about 12 acres in production, about eight are vegetables, plant breeding and seed projects, and we have some pastures, uh, hay fields, and orchards as well. And often there's so many crop varieties that we have access to these days that we start with everything. If we wanna look at new market classes for lettuce, we grow 40 varieties and hone in on two or three that we're interested in. And if the project is worthy of continuing, they might become the parents for new varieties that we're uh, breeding. And so what chefs are great at doing is creating an encyclopedia of different flavor experiences when they try crops that are new to them or different. So purple sweet potato starch actually works like a non-dairy thickener for vegan cooking and so on and so forth. And I'm sorry, I think I'm double clicking. Um, some of these uh, uh, experiences and lexicons that we create with chefs give us the opportunity to create, to take something like our bamboo patch, which was a quarter acre of invasive plants and turn it into over a thousand pounds of edible shoots every spring. These are lacto-fermented, pickled, turned into curries, chutneys, and shared with friends from Southeast Asia who have an intact culinary tradition of using this plant. With seed saving too, we have the opportunity to ask, what are some other crops that farmers can tap into with what they're already growing? This variety of corn behind me is one of my favorites. It's called Spinroso de la Val Sugana, and it was almost extinct a little over 10 years ago. A food historian brought this strain of corn to the US and distributed among several farms. And when we planted it in 2012, we grew a quarter acre and 10% of the plant stood at harvest, the rest blew flat. And so when you work with heirloom varieties that have been kept by one or two gardeners and you scale them up to a farm scale, there's often a lot of genetic work you have to do. And so over the course of selecting the nicest plants each season, we have this variety to the point where we can harvest it with a mechanical corn picker and harvesting equipment and grow it on a really large scale. Um, and in the process of doing that, we get to see it in all stages of growth because we're always looking for the most adapted plants which gave us the opportunity to offer baby corn to chefs who did elotes, they put it in burrata, and uh, did all kinds of creative things that I never would have thought of. Um, some turned our roasted cornmeal into pastries. And um, this is, I think, if we were a dedicated watermelon farm where we grew one crop for one specific purpose, we would be very limited in terms of uh, what our income would look like, how resilient we'd be in the face of climate change or market disruptions. And this is not something new. This is what farmers have done for thousands of years around the world. This is our shared history that's stored in crop genetics. And the corn in this picture is really special to me because it was a gift. 
Um, the woman who gave it to me is a Hmong refugee from Laos who came to forage our bamboo patch. She kept this variety alive for 30 years across three continents before her family resettled in Lancaster County, and it's a group of waxy maize land races that's going extinct in Southeast Asia. There are some really incredible folks like Sam Konselman who reintroduced me to some traditional Pennsylvania Dutch and food ways, uh, crops, I'm sorry, and food ways that um, were something my great grandparents may have known of. And so these are folks who, through seed stewardship and understanding the big picture of what they're growing, are able to take an ocean of commodities and turn it into an oasis for diversity. And this is relevant to what we do every year because we're trialing so many different crops that we want to explore all the possibilities. If we hadn't been mentored by these folks, we wouldn't have known that pumpkin vines and leaves are edible and nutritious and uh, great in curries and as a pasta substitute, or that <clears throat> when we work with fruit breeding, we have to have a really long-term uh, perspective on what we're doing what are the needs of farmers five or 10 years from now? What are all the factors we should be considering? Because we can't really go back and change something, uh, just like we can't get some of these crop varieties back once they're gone. And sunchokes are a great example. Uh, my dad remembers in the 70s and 80s that they were sold to local farmers as the next superfood. They required no fertilizer, uh, no irrigation, you'd yield thousands of pounds an acre and you'd be rich. And the uh, problem was that when sunchokes were harvested, no one knew what to do with them, so acres and acres got plowed back under. And you can still see them sometimes when you drive around in uh, September when they bloom. There are still a few hiding out on the edges of the fields there. Um, and that's not a problem now. 10 years of chefs and restaurants and creative foods have led to what could be cookbooks about sunchokes. And so this is really relevant when we take something that's totally different, like Apios americana, a high protein native legume that's well on its way to being a staple uh, starchy root. And we want to know, how would you or I cook this when we get it to our home? Because developing a sustainable food is just one part of the picture. So chefs taught us that they can be shredded and used as a coconut substitute. The high dry matter content because of the protein makes it act like cassava in recipes. And I think that when we take uh, this big picture of diversity and apply it to our food system, we can make some really incredible change really quickly. And this is one of my all-time favorite plants. This is Hibiscus sabdarifa. Um, it is a crop that's grown around the world for its red calyxes, the pod that forms after it flowers. It's, used, it's called Agua de Jamaica in Central America, Carcade in Egypt, and a host of other names uh, depending on which culture is producing it. But in India and Southeast Asia, it's one of the most popular leafy greens, and it's used similar to kale as a braising green. The taste is like sorrel, and one serving size of this plant is equivalent to 70% of your daily vitamin C needs. So there's this huge need locally among our new American communities to be able to find this plant because it's important to traditional diets. And currently, there's no way to produce seed in our climate because the varieties we have are not adapted to flower here in Lancaster County. So um, junctures like this are where we have an opportunity to create real and lasting change. And um, there's often a question of how productive can small farms be. And I like to think productive not just in pounds per acre, but nutrition per acre. And so here's something that's super nutritious. And when we've commercially produced it over the last three years, the yields are on par with kale, spinach, and other greens that we commonly eat every day and that farmers grow here. So it doesn't take much to um, shift our framework a little bit and to bring some of this crop diversity back. And so these are some of the brassicas that are cross-pollinating with the wild broccoli rob that I just realized I uh, skipped when I double pressed my clicker a little while back. So if I have time, let's reverse for a moment. I apologize. Um, so this plant found our way 
its way onto our farm in a commercial grain planting. And a lot of farmers consider it a weed, but it is the wild relative of turnips, broccoli rob, choy sum, mizuna, and a lot of greens that are now commonly eaten. We noticed it because after a freeze killed everything in our fields, the greens were still alive and vibrant, and chefs loved them. So we had a crop from January to February, and then what's more, it bloomed in the middle of March. So we had fresh vegetables when there was nothing else on the market, they were incredibly tasty and there was so much that they started pickling, preserving, fermenting, uh, powdering, turning these greens into pestos. We started digging the roots for horseradish substitute. So something that uh, with a little bit of food culture um, had been seen as a weed suddenly became a huge asset to our farm. So fast forward to where we left off. Um, this plant has started to mix with the other brassica rapa that we grow on our farm. It can cross-pollinate with Chinese cabbage, with mizuna, tat soy, and so it's starting to adapt to our farming needs and the diversity of crops that we have. And one of my favorite stories from my grandparents is that when we came to our farm now, it had been a tenant farm since the 1940s, and the soil was in really bad shape. Less than 2% organic matter. We did an earthworm core sample of six acres and found about that many earthworms. And uh, <laughs> my grandpa's tradition taught him that turnips are what you grew to return health to the soil. And so his first act was to get as many massive totes of turnip seed as he could find and plant the whole property. And uh, none of it grew, sadly, but uh, maybe not sadly for us because uh, boiled turnips got a little old by the end of winter. <laughs> and um, so in some ways, what we're doing now, coming back to uh, how I began this section, is not something new, but a process of adapting. And I think that when we learn from elder farmers, we learn that they're masters of adaptation, especially seed keepers. And so while these aren't grandpa's turnips, and they're certainly a lot tastier than turnip mash all winter, they have returned health to our soil. And in the fields where we grow the most brassicas, we have the highest earthworm counts. Now that same field where we found six, you can shine a flashlight at night after the rain and count dozens pulling back into their burrows. The more brassicas you plant, the more it increases your soil redox, but that's another uh, talk entirely. So um, we have real power as eaters and growers to change the way our landscape looks, but unless we help these foods to take root on our plate, as well as in the field, um, they're not going to last, and that's been repeated time and again, but I think that's a message of hope, because if we change the way we eat a little bit, then we'll, um, we can change our food system for the better really quickly uh, that's, uh, and produce foods that are healthier for farmers, eaters, and the planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Is anyone else a stomach rumbling talking about f this much food or just mine? <laughs> you might be able to hear it all the way from the front row. Um, our next speaker this evening is Mark Breyer, the Chesapeake Bay Program Director for the Nature Conservancy. In Lancaster, we're often reminded that our productive farmland without careful stewarding can create runoff that harms our streams and the Chesapeake Bay but we don't always hear the miraculous stories of regeneration. Mark is gonna tell the comeback story of the Chesapeake oyster, which is both food and a filter for clean water. Thanks for being here, Mark. And now for something completely different. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much, Diana, and to Hourglass, and to the sponsors this evening. Um, news about the Chesapeake Bay is often pessimistic, and I am sure many of you who live in Lancaster experience that with some frequency. Uh, I'd like to turn the tables on that tonight, though, and tell you a different story, and, and that's a story about optimism and hope. Uh, it's a story of a remarkable comeback and one that's at the intersection of food and culture and the environment. The lead character in this story, I have to go for my prop now, 
The lead character in this story, I'm going to tell you something about this cool shell, is the lowly eastern oyster. Oh, I missed my, my slide there. Beautiful picture of the Chesapeake Bay. This is what oysters look like naturally, growing in the environment, and here's a single shell. Despite its size in my hand here, oysters once formed entire reefs that covered all of the Chesapeake, or most of the Chesapeake, and in fact, many coastal areas around the world. John Smith, believed to be the first European who sailed up the Chesapeake in 1610, drew this map, and in his, the logs about his voyage said his ships were frequently running aground on oyster reefs. Maybe they looked something like this. Now, before I go further in this story, I should say a few things about what makes this small creature just so amazing. First, they are indeed delicious. I think so, maybe some of you don't, I don't know, we can cook them. Um, they're also full of nutrients and a lot of protein. But one of the things about oysters beyond food is the services they provide to us, in addition to being an amazing food. As I mentioned, they form reefs, and those reefs uh, can, can actually stop erosion, they can break wave energy, and they can serve as homes for other things that we like to eat, <laughs> like this fish here or crabs. One of my colleagues uh, says that for a fish like this, an oyster reef is like a five-star hotel with a fully stocked fridge. <laughs> you may also have heard that oysters filter water. This is uh, a picture from a partner of ours uh, in Annapolis, Maryland, called the Oyster Recovery Partnership. So oysters, a single oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day. They produce clean water by eating the stuff that causes the dead zones in the Chesapeake. And don't worry, they don't pass that on to us when we eat them. The filtration that oysters provide, though, really connects us all. You see, it's quite likely that the oyster that once occupied this shell, which I, I collected about 100 miles or so south of here, may have filtered water from the Conestoga River or from the Conestoga in Cumberland County, where I grew up fishing. And in doing so, that very oyster may have removed excess fertilizer that washed off my parents' lawn or off of a, a near, nearby farmer's field and magically converted that back into nitrogen gas that went up into the atmosphere. I'm not a chemist. I don't profess to be one. I don't quite exactly understand how that works, but it is simply incredible. And it really demonstrates oysters' power, the power of nature. The challenge we face, though, is that for the past three centuries, We've harvested oysters like they didn't exist, and we haven't really managed them for those other benefits that we've talked about. To be clear, during that time, oysters provided us quite a lot. Their shells, look at the size of that. Those are people standing on oyster, piles of oyster shells. Those shells were a really important construction material for many cities in the early 1900s, uh, for roadways, for sidewalks. They also helped employ thousands of people, shucking oysters, canning oysters. They were also helped to form the legendary waterman culture on the Chesapeake Bay. These are their skipjacks, their, their famous boat, which they dredged oyster with, oysters with. They were also, speaking of, of providing, we talk about protein and protein sources, uh, one of my colleagues who grew up in New York told me that her mom ate oysters regularly. They were not a wealthy family. They probably bought large cans of oysters like this. So for millennia, oysters were a cheap, inexpensive, and common food source. They're not today, as we, as we talked about. So the consequences of uh, a really unchecked harvest for, for many, many, many years, combined with excess pollution coming into the bay from its rivers, combined with a couple of diseases, left us in a very precarious situation at the beginning of this century. In the early 2000s, uh, wild oyster harvests had reached their lowest point ever, and many were clamoring for some sort of solution. And at that time, the governors of Maryland and Virginia thought it might be a good idea to introduce a non-native oyster, to bring an oyster that was from China, that they, we believed would be resistant to the diseases that were present in the Chesapeake, and introduce it. Thankfully, at that time, cooler heads prevailed and said, we're going to study this. We're going to look at it for a long time. Sorry, I skipped a slide. 
Um, the problem that we were having in the Chesapeake was not unique to the Chesapeake. In fact, it, it's happened all over the planet. Oyster reefs are one of the most imperiled habitats. Back to the Chesapeake, this proposal to introduce a non-native oyster took five years, five plus years, of really deep study by universities, government agencies, nonprofits like ourselves, to really think about, is this a good idea? Is this really going to help us? And thankfully, in 2009, policymakers and politicians followed that science and decided not to introduce it, but instead to double down on our native oyster. It was truly a watershed moment that it has led us down a really different path for the last 13 years. That path begins to reflect the true values that oysters provide to us as food, for sure, but also as a filter and as a food maker. At that time, state, federal agencies, nonprofits, universities, all committed to work together to restore reefs at really, really large scales, larger than we had ever thought before, did a lot of scientific work to understand how to best do that, and then invested in it and protected those reefs. We realized that oysters are critical infrastructure, just like bridges and roads, and that they require big construction efforts. This is a gentleman using a water cannon to blow shell and rock off of a boat in Virginia to build a new reef for oysters. Only a dozen years after potentially introducing a non-native oyster and being at the lowest point in our harvest, today we have the largest oyster reef restoration projects on the planet, three of which are larger than the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Just massive, incredible. The price tag is significant. I don't, I'm not going to lie to you about that. But we know it's, smart, it's a smart investment. Documented benefits of filtration and fish production from those reefs that we've restored show that that investment pays for itself in less than a decade. It's truly a global success story. Uh, we've never restored oysters, oysters at this scale before, and people are visiting the Chesapeake from Europe, Asia, Australia, to see how they might do the same. You saw from that previous map that I showed just briefly how many oysters we've lost all over the, the planet, and they provide so many services to us. At the same time as these large oyster reefs were being rebuilt, changes in policy helped enable oyster farming to take root in around 2010 and start to grow. It's increased nearly tenfold in the past decade. Farming oysters is an alternative to traditional harvesting of wild oysters, and its emergence is part of a transformation in food production, creating sustainable jobs like Alex was talking about, and helping to regenerate the bay. It's proof, I think, that we can grow our food without harming other things that we care about at the same time. Entrepreneurs around the bay are trying farming. Some of them are from the city who I've met. Others are traditional watermen who want a more stable income source and perhaps more control over their harvests. So the resilience of the industry was really tested a couple of year, years ago with COVID, particularly the farmers that were selling direct to restaurants. Those restaurants shuttered and they were in real trouble. They immediately started to think differently, direct consumer uh, sales to consumers. But also we were part of a program that was really exciting in that we raised some money and bought excess farmers that they couldn't sell and used them in restoration projects where they would perform all the good things that I was telling you about. This is one of our farmers, Scott Budden, who owns an oyster farm. Uh, actually, on the left-hand side, planting his own oysters that he had grown in cages on, an, on a sanctuary reef near his farm that'll be there for hopefully at least five or 10 years, filtering water, reproducing, making new oysters. The good news is that this work is also helping that industry diversify for the future. It's helping build resilience by creating additional markets, markets for consumers, but also markets for the environment. And it ref begins to reflect the multiple values that they provide to us. So to be clear, we're not at the finish line of this story. We're certainly not uh, all the way there. The oyster population is still a fraction of what it once was, and we have a lot of work to do still. But clearly there's hope, right? When I actually started doing this work, I've worked for the Nature Conservancy for 25 years. I've worked in Latin America. I've worked all over North America. But uh, I started the work in the Chesapeake for us in the early 2000s, right as this proposal to introduce a non-native oyster came about. And during my short time, not even 15 years of doing this, we've seen a complete turnaround. It really gives me hope. We've built the largest oyster restoration projects on the planet. The farming industry is growing, and just last week, the wild fishery announced its largest harvest in 35 years. So you may ask, uh, it's amazing. So 
So we're sitting here in Lancaster County, and you may be thinking, why am I telling you this story? I think for two reasons. One, well, three reasons. Diana asked me to, and I couldn't say no. Um, but also, as I said earlier, what happens here in Lancaster is connected to oysters downstream and vice versa. It's a really important symbiotic loop. But also because I believe that the factors over the last 15 or 20 years that led to the resurgence of oysters really is relevant to what's happening here in Lancaster with, with regards to agriculture, with regards to stormwater, anything that connects us where we live to the waters in our communities and the waters downstream like the Chesapeake. I've boiled it down to three factors that I think are really important. The first is science. We have to know what we want and where we're going, and we have to be able to measure to see are we on track to get there or not. If we hadn't invested in science with the non-native oyster question, I feel pretty strongly we might be trying to remove oysters from along the Atlantic seaboard right now. During that process, we found out that while we think that they were able to avoid our, uh, the diseases that are native to the Chesapeake, they were going to bring other diseases, some of which were harmful to people. If we hadn't invested in that science, that might be happening right now. The second issue is collaboration, or the second factor for progress, I think, is collaboration. You can't do anything big by yourself. This is a picture uh, from a number of us that were partners, different federal and state agencies, nonprofit organizations, some watermen that were involved in the restoration, the, the first big restoration project in Maryland. And I, put, I showed this picture up because it reminds me of what happened. We were ceremonially, ceremonially dumping that, that last bucket of oysters over, overboard. And we went back to shore, and there was a lot of press there, and they wanted to ask us about it. No one group said, we did it. Everybody pointed at everybody else and said, we did it together. It took a lot of hands. It took a lot of brains. And it just shows that, that big things take a lot of people and a lot of effort. My third and final factor is consistency. Achieving things takes a lot of people. It also takes a lot of time. Consistency of attention, of effort, of investment. This is a photo, the gentleman in the, in the hat with the flag is the Maryland senator, uh, state senator, Bernie Fowler. He passed away last November uh, at a very old age, and thankfully. Um, senator Fowler was a state legislator. I had the privilege to meet him once. And he was, he was a state senator, but he was also a farmer. And he was a, he was a really, really strong advocate for the river that his farm was adjacent to. And for more than 30 years, he led an annual event called a wade-in, where he walked with people hand in hand to see how far he could walk out into the water until his white uh, Converse sneakers disappeared. And he measured that every year. That's consistency of effort. It was a demonstration uh, of consistency and what he really cared about. And he motivated a lot of people on, along the way. His mantra, which lives on, is never, never, never give up. As I said, we're not at the end of this oyster story, but so far, I hope you'll, you'll agree with me that it's pretty incredible. I hope it inspires you to believe that with science, collaboration, and consistency, we can actually really achieve incredible things together. Thanks. What a comeback story. What do you think? <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. Lancaster is blessed with many community gardens, farmers markets, and passionate advocates who are reducing food waste and promoting local food. Up next, we're going to show an original video created for the event today by Connor Redkay about three local change makers who are spearheading these efforts right here in Lancaster City. Enjoy. I think mostly it's just about knowing this is your land and just knowing that you're a part of it and that you're the future. You can change it. Lancaster County is filled with farms. We have the best farmland in the country. But still, in our Lancaster city, there's people who don't have access to food all the time people who still wonder where their next meal is coming from. And that to me is just, is unacceptable.
My name is Hala Lasana, and I am the founder and managing director of Discerning Eye Community Agriculture. Discerning Eye Community Agriculture is a hybrid conglomerate where we use our for-profit brand as a umbrella to house DECA City Farms, DECA City Provisions, and Backyard Farming Cooperative. With Backyard Farming Cooperative, our idea is to have neighbors come together, learn how to grow food on their own properties, as well as collectively in our community gardens. There were so many challenges that I had no idea about. One of them is a deer, the other are the groundhogs. There's so much to learn about how to grow food in nature, as opposed to a big agro farm that has all the chemicals. We're not using any of that, so we had to learn a whole new way of doing things. So Blackbirds is this club that I started with my older daughter, who's now 12. We were looking for a Girl Scout or Brownies troop, and we couldn't find one. So I just decided to start our own club. My name is Zishan Ismet. I'm a geology professor, and I'm also founder of Blackbirds Environmental Justice. We clean up parks, we collect food for shelters, we shovel neighbors' sidewalks, and we do a lot of Mod Podge and glitter. I started this because I wanted kids to know that they can change the future in a positive way. But then through encouragement through a lot of my friends, they've asked to expand this to include adults, so now all ages are part of it. And we've expanded our mission where we focus on food, water, energy, and waste equity. When I was doing field work in Nepal, before my oldest daughter was born, I came upon this village that was not doing very well. And then just over the next ridge, people were doing very well. And the only difference was they had these digesters. And these digesters provided fuel, energy, even lighting. So I thought, I can't do field work here anymore without giving back to people living there. So basically, it's just compost. You put in a barrel and you capture the methane. Methane is the same thing as natural gas. We use it for cooking. So if it's being produced naturally, why don't we capture it? And so the digesters we're building are something that are cheap, accessible, and anyone can put together in like 20 minutes. I think the thing that makes Musser Town special is the people. Lots of people speak different languages, so you get to hear this variety. Like, it makes me think of the forest, right? It's a healthy forest, a healthy ecosystem has variety. I'm Shauna, and I serve as the community liaison for A Garden in the Light. So the Garden and the Light serves our neighborhood primarily. They wanted to find a way to really secure like sense of place and ownership of the place to refugee and immigrant families and make those connections between the neighbors and the land. A lot of folks who are like immigrants or refugees who have come here from a space where they like had a garden at home because they're coming from cultures where like that's more of a normal thing to do. A lot of people have had conversations with me about like, I used to be so connected to my sense of place and space and my food, and now I'm here in the United States and I feel disconnected from that now. I became passionate about growing food after a lot of self-inquiry actually. What I saw was myself as a child and some of the issues that we ran into growing up in a single family household. Food and food accessibility was a problem for us. I never knew it, we always had as much as we needed, but what I didn't know is how much my mom struggled.
we were able to create a pay what you can market using a donation based model creating access for anyone that came through, whether they had $2 to pay for an eggplant or $20 to give back to their community. When I would see a family come in and their eyes widen because they'd never seen anything like this before, I realized that one of the best ways to make an effect in the world is to work in the realm of your own story. When I have conversations with people, it's about wanting to have the connection again, and that the garden provides that. That's where the magic of this neighborhood happens, and why it's so cool that the garden can be a place where that magic can can grow. It makes me think of like the, um, the mycelium underneath all of the stuff in the forest that's connected to everything, and how like everything's speaking to each other through these connections, this web. When I sit on my porch and I see that happening. This ownership that people have, that it's like, this is my neighborhood and these are my people. My family's from Pakistan. And I know a few times when I visited Pakistan, my aunt needed fuel and she had to ask her husband or her son to get it, but they're too busy. Women are often on the bottom of the ladder. But if she could get the fuel herself, how empowering would that be? And I just thought, what an amazing way to put all of this together. I am out there and sweaty and dirty. There is a knowing in my being that I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. I want them to know that they have every right to do whatever they want. If you are passionate about something and it really is true to your heart, people feel it and it's contagious. Creating food access for others has become my passion so that nobody else has to experience the hardships that we did growing up. Wow, what a powerful video, uh, very inspiring. I believe uh, it deserves another round of applause. <laughs> Quickly introducing myself, my name is Parag Shah, and I'm fortunate to be a leader at the giant company. And along with me, we have Jessica Printy Gross, and she leads our corporate sustainability efforts. And today is a big day, not only that we are here, but we also introduced our annual impact report online. It talks about our purpose and our community efforts online. So if you get a chance, please take a look at it. And I want to give credit to Jessica for leading that effort for us. <laughs> we are honored to be here this evening to celebrate the richness of Lancaster County and the power that a single idea can make such a difference around the world. Our purpose at Giant Company is connecting families for a better future, and we believe those connections happen around the table and around food. We have been proud to live in this community and serve the Lancaster community for decades through our 12 stores and 2,000 team members, and through our efforts, through our partners, to enhance our sh shared priorities. We have been investing in improving our food system through our partnership with Rodale Institute, we have worked on reducing food waste throughout the launch of flash food in all of our stores and supporting our food bank and pantry partners. And we also recently announced our association and partnership with Harrisburg University 
for Center of Advanced Agriculture and Sustainability. Local investments ladder up to big impacts, so tonight we want to show our continued investment in Lancaster con County by contributing to the ongoing work of these grassroots change makers. I'd like to invite Hava, Shauna, and Zishan to take the stage to accept our contribution to the unbelievable efforts In closing, thank you for all your courageous innovation, for dreaming big, and for creating a better tomorrow for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. For anyone who didn't have your, your reading glasses on in the back of the room, they actually provided really nice, uh, generous contributions to each of those women, $3,000 towards their project. So thank you so much, Giant. Really appreciate that. And I can't wait to see what each of those amazing women do in the future for our community. I also want to give Connor another shout out who made the amazing video, who wasn't expecting us to see the intro three times, but we really wanted to build up some suspense. So thank you again, Connor. Yeah. Okay, we're actually going to take a 15 minute intermission and um, everyone can stretch your legs, use the restroom. I'm going to ask everyone to join us back here in, uh, let me, I'm, I'm trying to do my quick intermission math. Um, thank you, at, at exactly uh, 7.47, we will start up again. That seems like a very prompt time. Um, and when we come back, we'll watch a, a video on Brewbaker Farms, and then we will hear from our keynote speaker, George Steinmetz. So we're really looking forward to that. See you shortly. All right, everyone, welcome back. We're gonna get started. Uh, in the tradition of live events, uh, sometimes things change around as we've seen tonight. And unfortunately, our next speaker, Bill Spire, is unable to join us this evening. He just came down with a sickness at the last moment and wasn't able to be here, but the show must go on. So uh, up next, we're gonna actually see a a farm that's growing food closer to home. We're gonna watch a video about Brewbaker Farms in Mount Joy, who is the most recent recipient of the Pennsylvania Leopold Conservation Award. Brewbaker Farms has four generations working together not only to produce food for our community, but who are leaders in soil health, clean water, and renewable energy. So let's take a glimpse uh, into life on their farm. We're at Brubaker Farms in Mount Joy, Pennsylvania. My name is Mike Brubaker. We're a partnership between three of us, my brother, Tony, and my son, Josh. The three of us run Brubaker Farms. Our dad was always very progressive. He had a can-do attitude, and we learned a ton from him about how to work together. We prioritize soil health on the farm. If you treat the environment well or treat the soil well, then it'll treat you well in return. I wouldn't trade these boys in for anything. They're following my passion and, uh, and even taking it beyond what I ever dreamed of. Our largest focus is dairy. We have a 1,200 cow dairy. We also have broiler chickens that we raise uh, on contract. And we farm the acres that it takes to, to feed our dairy herd. We use no-till farming to try to 
not disturb the soil more than we have to. We also follow up all of our crops with cover crops. And along with protecting the soil is protecting the water. So we have riparian buffers along the creek and they do create that buffer between the fields and the, the stream for you know, filtering water and keeping it clean. They also provide uh, wildlife habitat. We have several local streams that flow right through our farm. One of them feeds a slightly larger stream, which is a very productive fly fishing stream. So we get to see the direct benefits to clean water when these anglers come in from out of the area and get to pull out these big trout. Farmers have to find ways to stretch their dollars to make some of these really important environmental improvements happen. And one of our good partners is NRCS. We've had seven equip contracts with them from things ranging from manure storages to their big five million gallon lagoon. We also did a cover crop contract. Uh, another one was for nutrient management to help reduce fertilizer inputs. We did a conservation stewardship program and that gives them incentive payments for continuing that existing conservation work as well as adding something that they aren't currently doing. We started doing practices like drag hosing and injecting the manure so that it gets the nutrients under the ground where they're going to stay stable and in place and available for growing crops. We also have an anaerobic digester where we take the methane from the dairy and we turn it into electricity and uh, that of course removes methane from the environment which is you know, considered a greenhouse gas and turns it into something that's a renewable energy source. Happy cows give you more milk, right? If they're happy, they're healthy, they're going to give you more milk. But we want to feed them in a way that they're efficient with their feed. We use a nutritionist and formulate very specific rations so that we can keep the cows healthy all year round. really committed to farmland preservation. It helps to keep a critical mass protected in agriculture that gives us and hopefully our future generations the security to continue to practice agriculture in this area. As a family and as a farm, we feel extremely blessed in receiving this award, mostly because I know several farms that are doing the same practices and other very good practices in conservation in the environment. So just knowing how competitive that is, it's just a true honor being able to receive a award like this. We're learning every day. We never have it all figured out and we, we kind of hope that we never get to the point that we think we have it figured out because then it's probably time to get out of farming if you, if you think that. But, you know, agriculture is important and there's an important opportunity for every farm, regardless of size, to be able to keep working towards doing something a little bit better, you know, environmentally and for better air, water, and soil quality. And the thing about it is, the profitability of doing it the right way is what really is important. We can't do it if we can't be profitable and we can't make a living. But if you can make a living doing what's right, you got sustainability. How incredible is their family? We actually are joined tonight by Luke Brubaker, who you saw in the film, so thanks for being with us, Luke. <laughs> in addition to their conservation efforts, you saw that Brubaker Farms is also a preserved farm. Thanks to the efforts of the Lancaster County Agricultural Preserve Board, Lancaster Farmland Trust, and other partners, Lancaster County is number one in the nation for farmland preservation, which is something, yeah, truly worth celebrating. <laughs> Up next, we have our final speaker of the evening. Oh, I'm, there we go. Up next, we have our final speaker of the evening, our keynote, George Steinmetz. Best known for his aerial photography, George has a restless curiosity for the unknown. 
Remote landscapes are changing climate and how we can meet the ever-expanding food needs of humanity. A regular contributor to National Geographic and the New York Times Magazine, he's explored subjects ranging from the remotest stretches of Arabia's empty quarter to the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest. Tonight, he's going to speak about his project, Feed the Planet. Welcome, George. Um, tonight, I'd like to share with you my own personal journey through the global food supply. This is a 10-year project that, began by, that I began by photographing his assignments for various magazines, and more recently with my own money, as I try to finish what has become a somewhat obsessive project. I, I first became interested in food about nine years ago when National Geographic asked me to photograph a story about how we're going to meet the future food demands of humanity. The experts are saying that by the year 2050, we're gonna to have to double the world's food supply. Part of that um, issue is to cope with the rising population as we go from now about 7.8 to 10 billion. Um, but the bigger part of it is the, the changing diets of the, in the developing world, where people in, who have more money increasingly want more protein in their diet. Um, this is gonna require a lot more food to feed all of those pigs, chickens, and ducks. And um, I've been working as an assignment photographer for the Geographic for about 35 years, and my specialty is aerial photos. And starting in the late 90s, I did much of that with an unusual kind of aircraft called a motorized paraglider. Um, this, this photo was taken in Iran in, the, in a desert called the Dasht i Lut, and I was flying a virtually identical aircraft to that. And um, it's the, this is the lightest and slowest motorized aircraft in the world. And it's basically a backpack motor with a parachute-style wing where you run to take off and land. Um, it, I can fly at about, it flies at about 30 miles an hour, and what's, it's, it's kind of like a flying lawn chair, and you have an unrestricted view, 180 degrees in horizontal and vertical dimensions. You only have to, you have to watch out for your knees when you get a wide-angle lens. Um, and it, it let me visualize remote landscapes in a, in a new way. I'm not like a, I'm not an adventure dude. I'm a photographer who, who flies. I'm not a, a pilot who takes pictures. Um, and I just, I, I fell in love with this kind of flying because it let me, it let me see the world in new ways and I was able to photograph parts of uh, remote deserts that had never really been seen from above before and from above you could see their, kind of how they work, their geography. I studied geophysics at Stanford and for me this was like, um, flying over the desert was kind of like graduate school. I could just, I could really explore and, and communicate um, the, these uh, really beautiful desert landforms. Anyway, so I, I photographed deserts. I got kind of obsessed with deserts. That was my last obsession. And I spent uh, 17 years photographing every freaking desert in the world. And um, I, um, I got, a, I got a, in Iran, I got detained three times for being a spy. Um, I snuck into Libya with my aircraft when Gaddafi was in power and went back again after he was gone. But I was able to, to, to go and see unique places in, in a unique way. And my editor at the Geographic, after I finished all, seeing all the sand, he, he thought it might be interesting for me to look at some green. And he, he wanted me to work in this story that they were calling Feeding Nine Billion. Now, if you did, it would be Feeding Ten Billion because the, the, the population projections were um, a little too conservative. Anyway, and so he asked me to photograph the story, and I said, well, you know, Farming would be interesting from the air, but it'd really only be interesting if you looked at like the mega farms. Like, you know, a, a zebra under a tree is kind of boring, but you get 10,000 zebra together, that gets kind of interesting. So I proposed looking at mega farms, and I thought that would also help communicate the challenge of feeding 10 billion. So um, he, he agreed to my notion, and so uh, he gave me a list of places to go, but, and I developed my own ideas as well. And um, I decided to go to three places. I wanted to go around the United States because in the US we have the most industrialized uh, farming systems. And I wanted to go to Brazil because it has the fast, most rapidly expanding farm systems. And I wanted to go to China because China's become the world's biggest importer of food and they also have, temporarily, temporarily they have the world's largest population. They're about to be eclipsed by India. Um, so I decided to go to those three places. And the first place he sent me um, was, was Kansas to look at, at dry land farming, dry, uh, wheat farming. And this is the, uh, the Volgamore family farm. Uh, Brian Volgamore is the most successful farmer in Scott County, Kansas. 
And he's, um, Brian went to KU and he, he studied agronomy and he, he approaches farming like a scientist. He has his, a small plane which he uses to, to survey when his fields are ripe. And he has a fleet of six combines to harvest them. Each one has a GPS, rec GPS on board to record real time the yield in each square meter as he's harvesting. And he compares that to his soil maps, his, his rain records, the seed type, the planting methods, and the fertilizer he applied. And he's kind of running this like a continuous experiment. He, he's become so damn efficient at farming that almost all of his neighbors decided to let Brian farm their land for him because they, he can make more money out of it than they can. So one afternoon, Brian lent me his plane and his pilot to do some poking around southwest Kansas. And uh, we, he took me around, and we came across a lot of feedlots in that area. And I became fascinated by this particular feedlot because it had a lot of uh, white, discarded dairy cows, and they stood out against the manure of the ground. And also, I liked the, the big crop circle in the background because it's very dry there, and they, they, there's a deep aquifer, the Ogallala Aquifer, and they pump the water up, and they're able to irrigate the land to feed the cows. So I thought, oh, I can see this little ecosystem. But I was, I was frustrated flying around in the plane because it was too fast, and it had this little window, and I left like a lawn chair. So a couple of days later, I went back with my lawn chair, and um, I took off uh, from uh, an edge of a crop circle, and, um, and I was flying around. It was at sunrise, and I was looking at all the cows, trying not to disturb them. And my flight assistant came on the radio. And he said, George, the guy who runs the feedlot, he's here, and he's kind of upset, and he wants you to come to land and talk to him. And I said, well, look, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm flying, I can't, I'll, I'll talk to him by half an hour when I land. He goes, no, he wants you right now. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I'm just not gonna do that. I'm taking pictures and tell him I'm working for the geographic and I, I blah, blah, and he says, well, he want, if he doesn't come, you don't come right down right now, he's gonna call the sheriff. I said, well, it's a free country. He wants to call the sheriff, call the sheriff. So this is me about two hours later. And, and um, I, when I landed, I showed the deputy, I showed him my, my Nat Geo ID, I explained what I was doing. Um, I'm a licensed paraglider pilot, airspace is free, and, and um, he confiscated my cameras, my car, and, and, threw, and threw me in jail. And he, he handcuffed me in the squad car, he seat, seat belted me in with my hands behind my back, and I asked him what this was all about, and he goes, well, son, we're, we're, we're concerned about agro security. That agro security. I was about my own security. I was about crashing in that feedlot and getting trampled by the cows. And it just started making, you know, I, I went out there with like no ill intent. I wasn't looking for dead cows. I was just trying to see how these agricultural systems work. And it just dawned on me that there are certain parts of our, of our food supply that people don't want us to see. And when you're a journalist and you ask somebody a question, they get all nervous. Well, that's your story. And so I thought, hmm, I need to look at this more closely. And so as I started my tour around the world, or at least three parts of the world, I started looking a little more uh, intently. Um, this is the, um, my next place I went was the Amazon, and this is the Amazon on fire um, in Mato Grosso province. And this area is being rapidly cleared for, uh, mostly for, for soybean fields. Um, and in the morning, the, 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 the smoke kind of hangs down uh, low like a, like a cloud in the, in the trees. Um, if you went a little bit further to the north, you'd see where they're clearing the Amazon uh, for cattle ranches and clear cutting it. And um, clearly, it's not a very sustainable practice. Um, but the, it's very difficult to make a living out of a, out of a intact forest, and so it's being rapidly cleared. It's very sad. Um, and in the same area, there are a lot of some areas with a lot of um, Brazil nut trees. Those are the last trees standing in the cornfields, and they, by law, they have to leave a little barrier along the rivers. Uh, to act as a filter so they don't get nitrates and such into the water. And so all you see left of the Amazon are the Brazil nut trees and these little little patches of forest. And the Brazil nut trees don't live very long because there's no ecosystem left to support them. Um, and uh, this, is, this looks like a, a little patch of forest. This is actually a, a barrier along a tributary of the Amazon, and they're harvesting soybeans. Um, I've been down there numerous times. I find the Am Brazil is fascinating for agriculture um, because they're you know, in the U.S., you go out to the, to the Midwest and you find these kind of like little dying farm towns as the farms get bigger and bigger. They, they're like Brian Volgamore, these big machines. They don't need so many people. In the Amazon, they're starting, in, they're starting in the late 20th century. So when they come in, they'll have, I mean, the farm sizes I was seeing, I was down there last month, they're averaging about 100 square miles. They're just massive. Um, and when they harvest, they get serious. And they had, uh, yeah, 30,000 hectares, about 100 square miles. And the company that, that owns this, they have about two dozen of these farms. They're the biggest soybean exporter in the world. 
when we had a, a trade war with China under President Trump, you know, that was the, that was the gold mine for the Brazilians because all of a sudden, the, you know, they had a much more exclusive relationship with the Chinese, and they're exploiting that relationship um, very uh, wisely, to be honest. Um, this is the um, the biggest soybean. This is a port in China near Shanghai that's exclusively for soybeans. Um, and they use it mostly for, they, they create soy sauce and soy products, but a lot of it is being used for, to feed pigs. Um, this is the biggest pig slaughterhouse in the world. There were 1,200 employees on the cutting room floor. They had a, a, a triple kill line. And the efficiency of this place was just, it was staggering. Um, it's also really amazing they let me photograph in there. And um, it, I've, had, I've been trying for years to get into a U.S. slaughterhouse and they won't let me in, which I find kind of curious. Um, <laughs> Um, and the Chinese have gone through a lot of issues with food security, and so they're trying to centralize their facilities so they're easier to control. But um, there are still a few uh, weak spots in the food chain. This is after it leaves the slaughterhouse. They have to distribute it through town, and it was raining outside. This guy was riding through traffic with his motorbike and taking it to the local butcher shop. Um, and uh, in, in China, there are um, the, the tastes are changing very rapidly. This was kind of a, uh, a rooftop yuppie kind of bar in Shanghai. People are trying out new kinds of food and sharing it on social media. Um, but they're eating a lot more, a lot more Western food, but not not like not like hamburgers per se. I mean, you can go to Pizza Hut in, in Beijing, but there it's more Chinese food made with just more protein. And like you go to, uh, I went to a wedding parlor and they had 12 courses of food. Each one was a protein course. There was not like a vegetable course. So there, um, there's a huge, and it's not just China. You find this throughout the developing world. Um, uh, there are also in China, a big trend is moving towards uh, convenience foods. And this is a, a dumpling factory because with two parents working, they don't have time to make the dumplings at home. Um, um, this is a, um, a crayfish festival, and 10,000 people showed up to eat crayfish. They emptied out an entire lake in one afternoon. In Brazil, they're having, um, they, they have some transportation issues in, in the Amazon, and so they started converting their soybeans into pork and then exporting the pork because, you know, you can have three, you can have three trucks of soybeans or one truck of pork chops. I need a lot more money for the pork chop. So this is just one pig farm. It's the biggest pig farm in Brazil. Um, those little things in the lower right corner, those are the bubbles for the biodigesters for all the, uh, all the pig manure. And you can see they have their own little ecosystem going there too. They have their crop circles to, uh, to grow uh, soybeans for the pigs. Um, this is inside one of the piggeries. And this is a European standard uh, pig farm. I got in a, a couple of these in the United States. They're very tough to get to, but the, this, was, this is pretty, st uh, pretty standard. And except this is European style. So in, in the European system, um, the pigs are required to have a certain amount of time where they're able to walk around freely. And some of the American, I, my understanding is in American pig farms, that's not always the case. Um, this is uh, one of the larger um, chicken farms. This is, raising, this is for raising fertile chicken eggs. Uh, to, to feed broiler farms, and they cut down, first they <laughs> cleared the Amazon, they realized no, no, they kind of wanted the trees because the trees act as a filter to, t to t take out airborne pathogens, so they planted artificial forest around all the chicken houses, and when I went there, we had, I had to get, I had to take a shower, get into a bunny suit, we had to, they had, they washed, the, we had to go through a, a cattle dip with the car to clean off the tires, the biosecurity here was really serious, um, it was very impressive. Um, and then you go inside. This is the um, uh, the uh, one of the, the laying rooms. This is a, actually a different chicken farm. But this one had they had four million chickens. They grew, raised 2.7 million eggs per day, and they never touched a human hand. Everything was on conveyor belts. Um, in Brazil, it's tropical weather, so they don't have to have any walls in chicken houses. Um, and uh, they, I was lucky because they had the roof off the conveyor belts when I was there. I got lucky. Um, and uh, again, they're in, the, in Mato Grosso, they're exporting a lot of the poultry because it's cheaper to, they get, the uh, transportation's a problem, the road network is really, is really poor, and so they'll, they'll uh, export the, the protein instead of soybeans as chickens, and they'll send different parts to different parts of the world, like, you know, the heads and the feet will go to China, and the thighs will go to, you know, to, to France, and they've got all figured out where the best price point is in the world. Very, very smart. Um, they say you are what you eat. This is inside the cafeteria of the chicken slaughterhouse. Um, this is the uh, the largest chicken farm in, in China. This is outside of Beijing. 
And I wanted to go inside, but it, they would have, I would have had to spend three days in, a, in quarantine to go inside the chicken house. So I ended up photographing it through the window. And they use robots there to try and minimize human contact with the chickens to avoid pathogens. And it, it, again, it's all done by, um, they, the, you see the robot in the back there, and the robot goes up and down the rows looking for um, objects that are cold and not moving, i.e. a dead chicken. And then they'll dispatch somebody to go and fetch the dead, chick, dead chicken out of there. And she was trying to reprogram the robot so it worked properly. But they're really, they're very, they're really smart about trying to, if you don't have people in there, they don't have problems. Uh, this is one of the largest chicken slaughterhouses in China. They supplied um, KFC and Pizza Hut and a bunch of other restaurants, mostly fast food. And it was like, kind of like a big slaughterhouse, just super efficient. Um, in China, they've got a lot of issues with, uh, with land use. I mean, China, if you think about it, it's about the same size as the United States, except they don't have a west coast. They've got, like, they, they back onto Asia, so they don't have the, you know, the, 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 the a prodigious food output of California, and, and a lot of it's desert in the Himalaya. And so um, they've got, you know, like four times our population, but a small fraction of our arable land. And even the land that is arable, a lot of it is very difficult to farm, like this area in the Los Plateau. And they've, these were, they, they put it, they cut in terraces with bulldozers. But to farm here, you, you know, it's very difficult to get uh, harvesting machines in there. It's mostly done by hand. And they also have a problem with a lot of the kids now. They go to school and they don't want to come back and work on the farm because farming is, especially by hand, is very difficult work. And so you have most of the farms I, I encountered was, was aging farmers and their kids who left to, to the city. They all wanted to work at the iPhone factory. Um, and even in, you know, kind of areas near, closer to urban centers, um, I was finding that farmland was being taken out by new housing developments. These are, these are uh, upper class Chinese housing developments. And to try to get the most out of the land, they covered it all in greenhouses. It's outside of Kunming. And they, they were growing, this is in the south of China, it was kind of like, you know, they're like Georgia. And they were, in the winter, they'd be air freighting these vegetables up to the north so they could have uh, fresh produce in the winter. Um, and even in the, uh, the warmer parts of China, they're losing a lot of uh, farmland to high rises. Um, this farmer had already, this guy's with the watering cans, he already lost his land for, a ro for road construction, and he was temporarily farming this land before they built more high rises on it. Um, so there, that's, this is one of the reasons why China's become, rapidly become the biggest food importer in the world. They have this you know, rising demand and, and shrinking ability to produce food. They're no longer self-sufficient. Um, I find it really interesting as I've gone on the world to, to look at different styles of creating the same product. Originally, I felt like I'd go to like, you know, the biggest sugar producer, and it's like, okay, I tick that box. And I realized, no, it's actually interesting to look at how the same commodity or the same food, maybe not a commodity, but it is made in different systems. And uh, this is one of the largest sugar plantations in Brazil. This one's also about 100 square miles for this one plantation. Um, all, you know, uh, very uh, well-designed monoculture. I'm not advocating monoculture, but these guys have, have got it down. Um, and this is the sugar plant. And that big tongue you see, that's what they call bagas. The bagas is the, um, I shouldn't walk with the microphone. Bagas is the, 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 the pulp that you get after you crush the cane. And they burn that for fuel. This, this, this sugar plantation actually uh, puts carbon back into the soil because they what they do with their bagasse, and they put, actually put energy back into the Brazilian grid, and they produce a lot of ethanol as well. So environmentally, this is far from the Amazon, and these guys are actually quite progressive. Um, and after being at the, uh, you'll see, um, after being at this, at this farm, I wanted to go and look at a, at a corollary in India. In India, it, for most Indians, it's illegal to own more than 10 hectares of land. That's, 10 hectares, that's about 25 acres, and that's unirrigated. If it's irrigated land, you're only allowed five hectares. These are called, they're called land sealing laws. It's a leftover from the decolonization period. And uh, so in India, when they want to make sugar, this is the ingest yard. And there, this, uh, they had 60,000 farmers who were providing cane for this one factory. And this is about the same size as the one you saw in Brazil, but they, by law, they had to source it from all these little farmers. So every guy has, every farmer has a, a phone with a little app on it and they can see what their delivery date is and they show up with their tractor. And these guys are really nice. I wanted to photograph the thing full and they were so efficient that the parking lot was never full. So they, <laughs> really nice. they stopped the factory for me <laughs> for about six hours and these guys are all getting really upset. So I got them all to st stand in front and have the picture taken. But, but this is, this is a, you know, this is about a half a morning's worth uh, of tractors. And so these guys are a two month period and every guy has his day to come in and drop off his tractor full from his little farm. 
And this is the ingest for the farm. They also bring some stuff in. It's consolidated not from the farms that are far away. They bring it in by truck, and they tip the truck to unload the, uh, the cane. Um, and this is uh, rice in, in Yunnan province in China. Um, you, uh, this area, Yunnan, is the, these are the biggest rice terraces in the world. They're over uh, 3,000 feet of vertical, and they're all carved by hand, and it's like this cascade of water going down the mountain. Um, and, but even this area is having a hard time. It's a, it's a World Heritage Site for agriculture, but they're having a hard time maintaining their fields because the kids don't want to do it anymore. And so they actually have to start paying. There's, there's, a, there's a, because it's UNESCO World Heritage Site, there's a, a photo lookout and they make a lot of money selling tchotchkes. And so they're actually paying people now to farm all these terraces so that they can keep them as a photo op. <laughs> kind of agro-tourism. This is actually, this is the uh, group of ladies who are actually being paid to, to plant rice in the rice terraces. Um, so this rice in China, in India, which is almost the same population, they have lots of small farmers, and it's a much more chaotic scene. This is um, one of the markets in India. The, the prices are all controlled by the government, and the government also provides subsidized food uh, to the poor. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very complicated network, but it's, it's very difficult for the farmers here to make a living. If you look at India by population, about 60% of the Indians are small-scale farmers, but they only make about like 25 of the GDP. And so they're all kind of low-wage farmers. They're all struggling and complaining. Um, and you go into, the, these, and they bring in, during, in that same market, they bring in uh, out-of-state workers from poor states to, to help with the harvest work or help with the, the, the winnowing. And uh, the men do all the heavy work, and the women, they, they look for the scraps, and they sell that. They're going through all the, the chaff, trying to find little bits that they can, they can eat or sell for their families. Um, the same guy who owned that big sugar plant in Brazil, he said, oh, George, you want to see a big farmer? You should come to our cattle farm. We've got 100 square miles of cattle and 30,000 cows. And this is Marco's farm. This was taken uh, about three weeks ago in Mato Grosso. And in Brazil, most of the, um, they don't do um, feedlot beef. The, the, for export, they do feedlot beef, but the domestic market, it's, it's poor, and so it's, um, it's free-range cattle. Um, this is the slaughterhouse. This is the JBS slaughterhouse. It's the largest one in Latin America. Um, and these are all white. These white cattle are it's a breed called Nilori. It's an Indian breed that does really well in the tropics. Um, this is the largest, or one of the largest feedlots in the United States. This is in, um, in, in Idaho. And this was started by um, a guy named Jack Simplot. He's a billionaire, or was a billionaire. He died a few years ago. And, and Jack, um, he, he, he grew all the French fries for McDonald's, and he had all this French fry waste, potato waste, and he realized he could feed it to cattle. And there's a lot of dairy cows in, in, um, in this part of Idaho. And so he started using it as, as, as feedlot, as, as the, the potato waste as, as cattle feed, and he's got over 100, I think it was 150,000 cows he had the day I flew over it. Um, this is uh, one of the biggest beef processors in the United States. This is a Tyson's uh, facility near Amarillo. Um, I also wanted to look at um, differences in production with, with coffee, and uh, this is a, a large Brazilian coffee farm. G typically, coffee is a shade plant, but the Brazilians plant in an area just at the edge of the tropics where they can raise coffee without shade, and they can machine harvest. They have this machine that drives over it, kind of like, um, it's kind of like two really long arms, and there's these fingers that go through it. It looks kind of like a car wash, and it rips all the berries off. Um, and almost every other country in the world that you get coffee, they have to pick it by hand, but Brazil, because of where they're planting and their methods of, of production, they have now 40% of the coffee market. This is one of their uh, techno coffee processing facilities. Uh, but coffee actually, it began in Ethiopia, originally in Ethiopia centuries, thousands of years ago. And this is one of the largest coffee processors in Ethiopia, where the workers all make $3 a day. And they're very happy. This, actually, the, the typical wage there is $2 a day. They're all really happy to show up for 3 bucks a day. And it's all done by hand. You see this is the washing station. So compared to like, you know, Brazil where it's all techno, techno, and then here it's all manual, manual. Um, and the drying, instead of going through a dry, drying machine, they have these big racks and the ladies cover them up at night and they unwrap them in the morning and they spread them all out to dry. And then instead of going through a machine, like with a laser to look for all the flawed beans, they do it all by hand. So when you go to Starbucks, what do you do? Do you order Ethiopian or Brazilian? I don't know. Uh, I order the one that takes best, but. 
Um, California is the world's biggest almond producer. Um, this is um, during the, the height of the floration, and um, they have, I think, something like three quarters of the commercial honeybees in the United States are in California for the almond harvest to pollinate all those, all those flowers. But every almond you consume requires a gallon of irrigation water, and as a native Californian, that's a problem. Um, this is cashew production in India. Virtually most of the cashews are grown in Africa, but they all come to India because of the, the cheap labor, and these ladies are really good with their hands. And they're all, every, every, every cashew I've ever had was opened by hand by a lady in a factory like this, sitting on the ground. Um, a couple years ago, somebody figured out a machine that lets you machine crunch them, and now most of the businesses moved to Vietnam where they have the machines, and these, this is the last uh, Indian hand cracking factory. This was taken about two years ago. Um, I also find it really interesting looking at comparative dairy operations. This is the largest dairy in the world. Um, this is in China. They had, I think, 35,000 cows at this one dairy. Um, they had eight rotary milkers in this one facility, and they went from cow all the way to yogurt in the same building. The efficiency was just phenomenal. I was told they're building a new dairy for 85,000 cows um, to feed the Russian market because after the Russian shutdown, that was that, that plane over Ukraine like a couple of years ago, the Russians said they couldn't buy any more Dutch cheese and so they decided to source all that. They made a deal with the Chinese to put in a new dairy. Um, this is the, one of the largest, one of the, the second largest, second, second or third largest dairy company in the United States um, called Milk Source in Wisconsin. And they have one farm for all of their uh, all of their, their their young female calves as they're getting old enough to be reintroduced to the dairy system. And um, that truck you see in the top, that's the, the water truck. They had a couple of vets on staff and every cow. You guys probably, in, is your, you're in farm area, but for young cows, you put them in these little hutches so that they have a little shelter and they have a little yard to go outside. But the, by dividing them up like this, they prevent the, the spread of communicable diseases between the cows. And as a corollary, this is the Banas dairy in, China, in India. This is the largest dairy in the world. This dairy produces 7 million liters a day. They have 450,000 members of their co-op, and every co-op member has an average six cows, two of them in milk. And they're all milked by hand. People line up to take their milk to the distribution center. They're scattered throughout the villages. They had 350 trucks that carry the milk to the dairy, and they put the dairy, the milk onto a milk train, and it goes to Delhi. Um, and what's really amazing about, about Banas is if you go to the store, like 80% of the price that you pay for milk in the store goes to the individual farmer in the co-op. Is it super efficient? Um, it's really phenomenal. And they also had they have a, a gas station from from their biodigester. They pay their farmers uh, a couple of rupees for every kilo of manure. They pick up the manure, they deliver it to the biodigester, and they compress the methane that comes off it, and they sell it as a gas station. Really innovative. And it's all it's a co-op. Um, <laughs> This is what they, 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 they got, genetic improvement facility. <laughs> and um, the, the, they were trying to improve the productivity of the Indian cows. This, this, is, uh, this cow, this uh, Holston from, from the Netherlands is actually mounting a buffalo, but she's, the, the, I don't want to go into too much detail. But anyway, <laughs> the, the, they were trying to improve the, the breed and, and they've, they've had, I can't remember the exact statistic, but over the past like 10 years, they've almost doubled the productivity of their cattle by crossbreeding. Uh, with with, uh, with Holstons, but if they have it all Holstons, they, they can't survive in that climate. So they're trying to figure out exactly the right the right blend. And I think you know one of the big solutions to feeding 10 billion is actually improving genetics. Um, this is in uh, in Peru, and that little thing you see in your right, um, that's a corn cob that was left in the ground. 6,500 years ago. It was the first agricultural site in South America, and I went to the local market and got the corn they're selling there today, and that's a lot of genetic improvement. <laughs> and, you know, this was all, that's all done. This is all, you know, pre-GMO stuff. Um, but I think now with the, with the modern tools, um, it, it's really exciting. I think that's, that's how we're going to be able to, to, to meet increasing demand. Um, this is a um, genetic research uh, facility in, in Germany, formerly East Germany, and these are all ancient plants that don't propagate by seed, little creepers, like, you know, like um, little, little vine creepery plants. And these are ancient food plants, and they're trying to keep them alive, but they're trying to keep them separate to keep their genetics separate, and they crossbreed them trying to get the most uh, 
productive and useful plants. And they were working with wheat when I was there. And this is an ancient uh, form of wheat they collected about 100 years ago in Romania. It's a, a three-headed wheat, and it's such a heavy head that it falls over in the ground, but they're trying to crossbreed that with something with a stronger stem so it doesn't go over in the wind. Um, and try to make, you know, make, try to make our, our fields more productive. Uh, this is in Washington State, where they were, um, these are all different ascensions of wheat. They're the, in, in the Palouse, which is the most productive wheat country in the U.S. And uh, this is not uh, uh, genetic modification, it's just standard crossbreeding, but they're trying to get the, the, the most productive and also the, the ones with the best millability, the best flavor, the most nutrition, and uh, trying to get the most out of our land. And to me, you know, one of the, to me, one of the goals I think that we should have it in food systems is try to get the most of the land we have in the ground so we can protect the existing wild spaces. And I see genetics is, is really the key to that, um, that and other you know, advances in farming practice. Um, this is um, hydroponic agriculture in the Netherlands, uh, mostly for tomatoes, but the, the, the pink uh, light was for uh, growing um, green, microgreens that they use at high-end restaurants for chefs. But in the Netherlands, they have really, in the winter, um, you can't really grow very much, so they have artificial light in the winter months to extend their growing season. Um, and uh, this is one of the largest tomato farms in the Netherlands. They, they started off growing these hyper hydroponically. People used to jokingly call them water bombs because they had no, they were like red water bombs that had no flavor. But they actually are really quite tasty. And you find a lot of these are, th th there's these expanding in the United States now too, the same systems. The Dutch are really the pioneers of this. I mean, the, the Dutch are the, um, United States is the biggest food exporter in the world. Number two, the Netherlands. These guys are really good. Um, and part of it's because it's all like, you know, they're in a really small country, so they send it to Belgium, it counts as an export. But, um, you know, if you look at it that way, maybe California would be the biggest in the world, but, but still, the Dutch are very, very, very impressive gardeners. Um, uh, this is in, uh, in, in Japan, where they, after the uh, nuclear disaster at Fukushima, they want to have local food, and so they developed this rotary, um, a rotary hydroponic system, and they plant the baby, the little baby spinach and, and lettuce in the center, and it turns once a day, and it's all it's floating on a, on a bath of nutrients. And after 30 days, it gets to the outside, and they pick it and send it to market, and it's quite tasty. I mean, I, I personally am not that keen on some of this techno food, because I, I feel like I'd rather have something coming out of the ground, but stuff tastes pretty good. Um, this is in Newark. I live in New Jersey, and local food. Um, this is one of the biggest vertical farms in New Jersey. Um, my understanding is uh, that they're not really making any money, but it's a it's a it's a proof of concept, and it could use a hell of a lot of electricity. Um, but they're growing uh, local vegetables in, in an old factory in Newark. And one of the biggest problems is that they is air circulation because we have that much. Uh, that many LEDs in a building, you get a lot of heat and humidity building up, and they kind of kind of moldy stuff in the bottom and dry stuff in the bottom, and the air handling is really complicated. So I don't really think the technology is quite there for this kind of stuff, let alone the just the sheer energy cost of this kind of food. It's a little bit, I think it's a little bit ambitious. This is actually how they do it. This is called aeroponics, and so they they plant the seeds on a little mat. It looks like astroturf, and the roots dangle down because they have a spray of nutrients coming from down below. Um, the glow of lights is courtesy of George Steinmetz, but um, <laughs> but it's it's a really it's a really interesting te technique. But I, I just don't I don't my sense was the economics are not are not quite there yet. Um, this is the biggest uh, carrot producer in the world. Uh, this is Grimway Farms in California. They pioneered those you know those little baby lo bunny love carrots, those little stubbies. They, they, they didn't figure it out, but they they bought the guy who figured it out. And what they figured out was that you want to get a skinny little carrot, it's about nine inches long, cut it three pieces, and they put it, they would let me float off the room, but they, they had this top secret kind of thing, it looked like a clothes dryer that takes the skin off. And so there's convenience carrots, convenience food, just like in China with the, you know, the dumpling factory, well, the convenience food is great because people don't want to spend all this time like peeling carrots. I used to hate how my mom had me peel the carrots and cut my fingers. Well, now you get bunny love, and anyway, these guys are, are, are crushing the market with their skinny little carrots. Um, <laughs> And it's also interesting, um, you know, I, the, I was talking to the guy, who, the, their head, head of production, and he, he said they, they, do, they do organic carrots, too. And he said, you know, we, make, we like organic because we make more money out of it. Um, but he said, you know, we use twice as much land, twice as much water for organic product. Because they, in California, they have to irrigate. When they have to, the, uh, carrots take a lot of nutrients out of the soil, so they, have to, they, have to, um, they can't plant every year. They have to put a cover crop in between years. And they have to irrigate the cover crops, so they're looking at twice as much land, twice as much water. And so 
I, I personally, I know it's kind of a dangerous thing to say, but I'm concerned about organic, everything's organic is a solution, but if you use twice as much land, twice as much water to feed 10 billion people, I don't say we're gonna get there. I, I don't really know if that's gonna work, but that's my two cents. Um, I shouldn't say opinions, I'm a journalist, but I don't say we're gonna get there. Um, this is the biggest organic lettuce grower in California. Um, uh, Earthbound Farms, when you buy the, they sell it in those little clamshells, and they have these laser, laser uh, laid out fields, and they cut early in the morning so the lettuce doesn't wilt, and they have a machine, it looks kind of like a Zamboni, it cut the, you know, at the ice rink, and it cuts the, cuts the lettuce off about a half inch above the ground, and they have the, uh, these uh, Mexican laborers to go out in, in front with flashlights to make sure they don't get any rabbits in there, um, but it was um, really technical. Um, and uh, this was the, um, the biggest, um, pardon? Is there a question? Um, this is the biggest lettuce grower in California. These guys are um, Taylor Farms, and these guys really had their agronomics down because they plant like eight different kinds of lettuce and they can harvest it. It all, it all ripens at exactly the same time and they box it in the field and it goes straight from farm to market, direct. I mean, the, the boxes you see are the same ones you would find at, you know, Costco or your Giant or whatever. Um, but to get them all to harvest exactly at the same time is, is really tricky and these guys have really got it, they got it down. Um, and this is a crop research in, at the University of Arizona. They were working with, a, this is a, a robotic scanalyzer. It does a, basically it creates a three-dimensional uh, laser scan of the entire field. Here they're doing sunflowers. Um, and it was, when I took this picture, it was 110. And they're trying to look at heat tolerance and drought tolerance to make um, crops that will thrive in more, the hotter and more radical environment that we're getting as the climate changes. Really impressive work. Um, and this is in, uh, sometimes you, you find solutions in, I mean, all these solutions to me are not just in, in, in you know, the techno-American world. This is in, in India, uh, where the Tata group was working on a, a coffee plantation. If you look closely, you see those, the, the, the undergrowth is white, and that's all coffee. Coffee is, outside of Brazil, it's a shade plant. And they're growing peppers on the shade trees, and this is harvesting the peppers. And they have these guys got these poles with little, little steps on them, and um, they were harvesting black pepper. So they get, they were, they were dual cropping, really creative. And this is actually tiger and elephant habitat too. So they were doing it, protecting the forest, protecting wildlife, and getting two crops out of one. It wasn't super productive in terms of like yield per acre, but they were doing it. It was impressive to me. Um, and the biggest tractor manufacturer in the world, it's not John Deere, it's Mahindra in China. And you can get your tractor in any color you want as long as it's red. And they're all little, they're all little simple little things. No, you know, no awning, no GPS, no, no disco system. But it's a really simple tractor. And their, their idea is to democratize farming to kind of like power to the little people. And uh, in India, there are a lot of little people to power to. So they're doing well. Um, this is in Pennsylvania. This is the, um, the Rodale, uh, Rodale Institute's experimental farm. And this is just outside J.I. Rodale's house. And they don't use this anymore, but he had this idea like he wanted to make these soil profiles, like, you know, organic soil, and you, could, you do different soil experiments. So he built silos in the ground so to protect the soil, and then he had different experiments he would do to see, to, to try and build up the soil. And now it's used as flower beds outside his house, but I thought it was kind of cool. <laughs> and here in Lancaster, I came down here because I wanted to look at, uh, I saw a little statistic somewhere that Lancaster County is the most productive non-irrigated farmland in the United States. That, that's, that's pretty interesting. I want to go down and see what those guys are doing. So I came down here this time last year. I started poking around. And this is a conventional farm. Uh, not, it's near, near Kinzer's. Um, and right on the left is an Amish farm. And this is them harvesting. And I just find it really fascinating. The, 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 I mean, you guys probably know this is your area, and I feel kind of, it's kind of dangerous coming as the out-of-towner coming in and telling you about your own thing. But I, 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 I find it really interesting. The, 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 most of the Amish farmers that I met were using conventional systems. They were using like GMO crops and, 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 and fertilizer, but it was all 19th century technology in terms of the machines and farm animals with a little bit of help. They have like a baling machine in the back. Um, and it was, it was really difficult getting access to take pictures, but I found with the drones a little easier because it wasn't like a person, it was the drone taking the picture. And, and I could like, show their wife the screen while they, I was like a mile away, and they're, they're pretty nice. They let me, you know, I took a lot of persistence, and one of my drones ended up in a tree, and he charged me $1,000 to get out of the tree for the tree picker, but I got my picture. You do what you gotta do. Um, 
And uh, this is uh, right nearby. I, I find it really interesting, like how, you know, in, in Amish country, how the small scale farmers are trying to make a go of it, and they were raising um, uh, free range uh, not, or pasture raised chickens, and they had to move these coops every day. And they had the dog out there keeping the foxes away. And it was a really nice way for a small family farm to make a go of it. And because of where they are, they can sell uh, these things for these eggs for lots of money in, in urban areas like Pennsylvania and New York. And um, so I think I think this might be my last photo. Yes, that's not my last photo. That's somebody else's. So anyway, uh, this is a small crowd. One of the things I love about being with a small crowd is I can take questions. So does anybody have any questions? No questions? You let me off easy. Yes, in the back. Is depletion of soil? Yeah. It's a huge issue. Yeah. I mean, the good news is I think soil can recover if you if you do the right things. Um, but it's, I mean, people are short-sighted and, um, yeah, it's a problem. I mean, and I don't know if, you know, the, the, the I was thinking about going to Florida, but this, this is the right time of year to go to Madagascar to look at the runoff, but it's, it's a problem all over. And uh, it's just, it's very, it's very challenging for me to photograph it. Um, it's easier to photograph what's working is it, or something working than something that's not working. But it's um, it's a huge issue and uh, all over the world. I don't think I don't, I don't think anybody is a particular you know bad guy, but it's a big problem. Yes. Is there anything that you stopped eating as a result of your work? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I you know it's funny like I, you know I, after I go to the like pork factory I don't I didn't order ribs that night um, but. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a vegan or vegetarian, and I, actually, I, I, I'm 64 now, and I started gaining weight like about a few years ago. I didn't like it. So a few months ago, my kids all are on college now, so I can eat what I want. I'm not like, I got all the Oreos out of the house and stuff. Um, and so I'm on a new diet now. It's, kind of, it's not a fab, but I, just, I don't eat um, carbohydrates. And it's, I've lost about 20 pounds in the past three months because I'm just eating protein, and I don't really care if it's shrimp or beef or chicken or, or salmon or whatever, but protein and salad. And, and, but that's more, it's more for me for my diet rather than ethically. Um, I do personally, um, I mean, I'm not telling people what to do. And as a, as a journalist, I feel like my, my job is just to go out and record the information. And I'll go into the world's biggest slaughterhouse and I'll say, wow, like, how do you kill 10,000 cows a day? That's really cool. And I'll write down how they do it, and I'll put that in the book. And I'll go to the organic guy, who he's trying to do what he's trying to do. I just want to get his information and put it out there, because I want people to be able to make their own decisions. I don't really think it's my job to tell you what to do. But you ask me personally what I do. Like, I, when I buy milk, I think about, like, the really mega dairy, like this monster dairy in China, or, or the, the really big ones in Wisconsin, where, like, you walk into the really mega dairies, and the cows are afraid of you, because they never see people. And you go into the organic dairy, and it's like, you know, the cows are like, oh. It's, it's, it's just, and I, they, they don't run away. And um, so I just feel like when I buy, buy milk, I just feel like I kind of, it's friendlier to the cows to, to buy the organic milk. I still drink milk, and dairies are, I mean, I don't know. They are what they are, but I, 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 I still buy the product, but I, I personally feel more comfortable buying organic. But if you want to buy conventional, go for it. It's all right. You know, buy Ready Whip. Go for it. It's all right. Yes. Uh, what's next for you as a photographer? You know, it's a little off topic to science I don't know. You know, the, the, you don't really solve a. Yeah. I, I'm trying to finish food, and it's been it's been kind of crazy because I've been doing this for like eight, nine years, and I realized I had to finish it because it's food's infinite, and and, um, and you can't do everything. And if you did everything by the time you finished it, it would, it would change. You have to go back because actually farming is very dynamic. The systems are changing rapidly. So I don't know. I think I'm, I'm going to try and finish within the next year. And um, I'm trying to get, like, the, the, I got a list, kind of a crazy shoot list. I want to go to, it's kind of weird, I want to go to Somaliland because they ship about a million goats to Saudi Arabia for the Hajj. Other, on the third day of the pilgrimage, every pilgrim's got to kill an animal. And so they have this goat rush, like a week where they ship out a million goats. And I want to go for the goat rush. So there's kind of these crazy situations, obscure things that nobody knows about. <laughs> so I, I got a list of, like, things that I'm going to do in the next year. Um, to kind of fill in my, my, my checklist of all the weird stuff I found doing research. And after that, I don't know the next thing. I, just, I find it really interesting as a journalist to work on one concentrated thing. Like I did 15 years, 17 years of deserts. I found some really weird stuff. And I wouldn't have found that stuff if I hadn't just focused on extreme deserts. 
And so I've been looking at mega food systems and I'm finding like, like the goats in, in, in you know, Somaliland. So I'm having a really good time doing that. But the next thing, I, I don't know. I, I, don't th I think my, para my paragliding days are kind of over. But the drones came along just in time. And so, um, but I, I don't know. I have to figure that out. I, I'm going to try to finish. I'm still kind of looking at the goal line instead of what's the next, you know, 15-year project. But, um, so I'm not. I didn't. I mean, I'm, I didn't grow up in food. I grew up in, in L.A. and I was not a foodie. But I just something I, I stumbled onto, and I thought, well, like first of all, I got kind of annoyed this guy was arresting me in Kansas. <laughs> but I just realized that you know, in the United States, only one percent of the people are involved in produ food production. And so there's a huge disconnect between the consumer and the producer. And I think that's really a problem because I think our, our, our food decisions are really, I think they're, they're environmental decisions. And do you buy like organic or do you buy, and everybody thinks like, oh, I'll go organic. But it's like, actually organic is actually, it's a little more complicated. And, it, and it's like, organic might be one thing here, it might be a different thing there. It, it's really complicated and, and if you buy you know, or organic from, the, from, if you buy one product, what, what did they feed that product? Where did the nutrients come from? What were what the methods? How was it transported? It's all really complicated. And so I'm trying to add more transparency to those decisions so people can be, make more informed decisions. But like, you know, when I showed some of these pictures of Mega Farm, I did a big project um, for the New York Times on Mega Farm. I showed this stuff to the New Yorkers, they're like, what? They, they just had no idea because they're all in there. I mean, to me, to be honest, I mean, New York, it's kind of crazy. All these people living vertically, it's kind of like the, the, the big CAFOs. It's like they're all in this like, confined animal feeding operation. It's all, it's, you know, they're all in the vertical. It's, it's crazy how they live. I mean, to me, as a New Jersey guy. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they look down on me. But it's just, you know, it, it's just, um, so I, I'm finding it really a fascinating thing to explore. And I, I feel like there's this huge disconnect. And if I can help have a little more dialogue between the two. And what's really satisfying to me is when I go and photograph a, a farm and, you know, like the vegans think it's terrible and, and the guy who does the dairy operation, like, yeah, that's great, that's how we do it. And I want to be, but then I played it up the middle. And that's what I try to do is just to show, you know, honest information so people can make their own choices. So. Yes. Well, the Amazon is really big, and it, it's, I mean, it's, and even how you define it is kind of complicated. If you look at it for the whole basin, there are parts of the Amazon that are not really even in the, they're, they're not really that tropical, and so because it's a huge, you know, it's like the Mississippi, you know, it's just, it's, it goes up to Montana, it's all, you know. So I think in terms of, the, if you look at the Amazon basin, I think maybe 20, 30 percent is gone. There's a lot left, but I just don't see a solution there. I, I, I don't see a way that I'm not, it's, I find it really tragic and it's a really sad place to go. Um, and I find it really fascinating and important, but I don't, I haven't, I haven't seen a solution to preserving forests because preserved forest doesn't pay for itself. And I have people paying carbon credits, like who's taking the money for that? Who's protecting it? And it's just really complicated. So I haven't, I hope, I hope there's a solution. I just haven't seen it yet. Yeah. So based off your research, are you optimistic about our ability to feed 10 billion people? Yes. You know, there's new, um, the same editor who, who gave me this food assignment, he's retired now. <laughs> um, but he, um, he gave me an assignment. He asked me like, you know, 20 years ago to a story about the, about the, called the end of cheap oil. And I studied geophysics at Stanford. I was, I, I was trained to be like an exploration geophysicist to find oil. And I said, Dennis, you don't really understand oil. It's like, you think it's like a tank in your car, and when we're out, we're out. And it's like, it's, no, it's not like that. It's like, um, oil is like a, it's like a sponge. The, or, or it's like a sponge, and the harder you squeeze it, the more you get out. And like, we, everybody thought we were running at cheap oil, and then like fracking came along. All of a sudden, there's a hell of a lot more oil, because there's new technology. And so if you can find, you look at these guys with genetics, and, um, and, and if they can develop new, you know, new planting methods, new, uh, new varieties, new fertilizer methods, new, um, I mean, I think anybody who bets against human potential is a fool. I mean, you look at, you know, what, what we developed over the past millennia as humans, I just, I don't see, I, I don't see us reaching a limit to human creativity. And, um, but I just think that there, there needs to be, I think people need to be more aware of their, of their choice, have more ac accurate information. So when you buy like, you know, 
Land O'Lakes butter and you see like the happy cow under the barn, that's just, that's not the reality. And, and I think we need to be more connected to, to our food sources and have more, more information. So thank you all for coming tonight. Let's give it up for George Steinmetz. Thanks so much for joining us here in Lancaster this evening. My takeaway from the talk was that Lancaster County has the best business people because our farmers charge $1,000 to get a drone out of a tree. So we're, we're bringing the money in here in Lancaster. Um, well, I hope that George's talk uh, will change everyone to think a little bit differently the next time you're in the grocery store. Who feels like they're going to think a little bit differently about the food that's on your plate and in the grocery store after watching some of those photos about how food is produced? And um, personally, it makes me really thankful to live in Lancaster County where we do still have the posted, posted stamp farm and we have uh, local family farmers producing food for us in a way that really stewards agrobiodiversity, like we heard about from Alex. Um, so I'm really appreciative for all the people in this room who do work in food production and get that food on our table. Um, I'd like to thank each of you for joining us today for our community forum. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. Uh, let's give our speakers another round of applause for getting up on stage today. I'd like to thank the staff at the Ware Center for your help at the event today and our sponsors of today's event. And I'd also like to thank the Hourglass Board of Directors and volunteers and members and donors who make our work possible all year round. Um, Hourglass is actually celebrating a really big milestone this year. This is our 25th anniversary. So yeah, I can't take credit for any of that. I'm the newest person, but. Um, for 25 years, Hourglass has been focused on quality of life issues for Lancaster County, and we have a lot of thought-provoking events in store this year, so I'd like to invite each of you to join us, whether it's following us on social media or signing up for our email list or becoming an Hourglass member. I just want to invite you to be part of our community. And for anyone who, it sounds like we still have lots of people who are eager to talk about food and have lots of questions for our speakers. So I would love to invite each of you to continue the conversation with us. We will be um, just nearly across the street at C'est La Vie. Uh, they have generously provided some appetizers for us and we look forward to connecting there. And so thank you all so much and have a great evening. <laughs>